Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Good to see everyone. MashaAllah, beautiful Saturday morning here. And uh, <coughs> inshallah, we'll be doing, uh, we'll meet twice, inshallah, today and then next week at the same time to discuss. Um, so the topic is sins of the heart, and we'll be, we'll be looking at the conversation from <coughs> a book by Imam al Nahlawi. Imam Nahlawi, rahimahullah was a, a scholar of Damascus uh, the last century. He died 1931 on the Western calendar, uh, 1350 on the Hijri calendar. He's not very uh, famous, quote-unquote, uh, except in, in Syria. He's known in Syria. He was a Hanafi jurist and an ethicist, and this is his most well-known work. It's called Al-Durr Al-Mubaha, Fil Hadri Wal Ibaha, which translates as the uncovered pearls in the <coughs> lawful and prohibited. Ad-Dur al the un- pearls that are uncovered uh, with respect to this topic of al-hadr wal-ibaha, what's lawful and prohibited. And it's a very uh, unique work uh, in the sense that it, it, uh, it combines both law and ethics so, or you could say the, both the outward and the inward dimension of the law. So most standard books of fiqh deal with the outward dimension. And most standard books of ethics deal with only the inward dimension. But there's a few books in our tradition that bring both together. And uh, the most famous of which, of course, is the Ihya al-Muddin, Imam al-Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences. Uh, but this is a later work. It's a Hanafi work. Imam Ghazali was Shafi'i, so it's a, it's sort of a Hanafi version, and then it's very condensed. It's only one volume, and a lot of uh, Ghazali's conversations and definitions are presented in a very summarized, succinct manner. So it's a very <clears throat> uh, easily accessible manual. Uh, as opposed to Ghazali's, you know, multi-volume, four big volumes. Um, and and as we mentioned, this has a lot of uh, fiqh details from the Hanafi tradition. So <clears throat> uh, the most, uh, the, the lengthiest chapter of this book is the chapter that deals with akhlaq, which is the, uh, which is ethics, virtue ethics. And he lists over a hundred blameworthy traits. Uh, what he calls sifat dhamima, so reprehensible, blameworthy traits, some of which are haram, some of which are makru. And so the goal <clears throat> is for the believer to study these, and each one is anywhere from one to three pages of discussion, so it's, it's manageable, and, uh, and to just avoid them to the best of one's ability. And of course, this is a tall task to... Uh, to navigate life while avoiding these these blameworthy traits <clears throat> and the, this is to, to do so successfully is encapsulated in the word taqwa so taqwa this term that we hear often <clears throat> almost every khutbah will begin with the verses from the quran calling us to taqwa and the root of taqwa ha- it comes from wiqaya which is a shield the wiqaya is a protection and so the idea is to protect oneself from everything that Allah hates. Taqwa is for the person to shield himself or herself from that which is offensive to Allah, that Allah has deemed either unlawful or reprehensible. And so if a person can learn these Mm. and stay clean of them, uh, they will be a person of taqwa. And uh, uh, so... And so this also, it, it presupposes introspection, which is a good point of departure for a conversation on sins of the heart, is that the person must be uh, accustomed to self-examination. A person must, a, a believer who's serious about his or her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be in the habit of just being honest with themselves. And, and this is a great adab. In fact, this is the adab according to some of our masters. So Abdullah ibn Mubarak, one of the great imams of the tabi'een, he says, قَدْ أَكْثَرُوا النَّاسِ فِي الْأَدَبِ He says, many, many people have tried to define what adab is. It's translated as etiquette, comportment, manners, proper 
proper action vis-a-vis -vis Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, adab, all of these meanings are there. He says, Qad aktharu an nas fil adab. Many people have tried to define adab. And then he says, Wa nahnu naqul, we posit that it's ma'rifatun nafs. He says, we posit, our estimation is that adab is ma'rifatun nafs. It's to just know oneself, self-knowledge. And uh, self-knowledge is the beginning of wisdom. This is the beginning of wisdom in all wisdom traditions, is to start with knowledge of oneself. Uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadili, rahimullah, another great ethicist of our tradition, he says, إِذَا رَادَ اللَّهُ هَوَانَ عَبْدٍ When Allah wants the servant to be humiliated, سَتَرَ عَنْهُ عُيُوبَهُ He veils the servant from his own faults. And the person in their psyche, they're like, I'm fine, there's no, there's no problem here. This is a sign that Allah wants to lower the servant. Hawan. Allah wants the hawan of that servant. And then he says, Rahimallah, wa idha radallahu izzahu. But when Allah wants the servant to triumph, to be like a supreme, great one, uh, an eminent person, what's called a master. Basarahu biha. Then he, Allah shows the person his faults. Allah lets the person see their, their faults. Liyatuba minha. So that they can make tawbah from them. So they can change. Toba is to just let go of them. So again, it presupposes introspection. The student of the student of uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadili, Ibn Atta'ila, rahimullah, he talks about this ethic in one of his maxims when he says that aslu kulli ma'asiyatin wa shahwatin wa ghaflatin ar-rida'an in nafs. He says the foundation, the, the, the ground from which every act of disobedience comes from the foundation of every shahwa, every illicit lust that's for something that will harm the person. Wa ghafla, every, the foundation of every time a person is thinking of things other than Allah. Aslu kulli ma'asiyatin wa shahwatin wa ghaflatin arrida'an in nafs is, what's the foundation of all of that? Is to be self-satisfied, is to be content with the way you are. This is the this is the foundation of all these harms. Wa aslu kulli izzatin wa wa aslu kulli ta'atin wa ifatin wa wa izzatin ad adum adum minka anha. And the and the foundation of every act of worship and every uh, and every afwan yaqadatin foundation of every act of worship and the foundation of every time when you're paying attention to Allah and the foundation of every ifa is to be able to restrain yourself from what's unlawful, what's offensive. Adam rida minka anha is when you're not content with yourself. When you think about yourself and you just shake your head saying what a mess. That's the, that's the, that's the basis of success. When you, when you just shake your head and say what a mess. This is what he's saying, that Adam uh, Rida, you're not content. You're, you're very unhappy. You're very, very displeased with your, your level. And then he says, Even if you kept the company of a scholar who's content with himself, even if you kept the company with an alim, with a great scholar, who's satisfied, satisfied with himself. فَأَيُّ عِلْمٍ لِعَالِمٍ يَرْضَى لِنَفْسِهِ Because what knowledge does a scholar have if he's content with himself? What, what type of knowledge is that? وَأَيُّ جَهْلٍ لِجَاهِلٍ لَا يَرْضَى عَنْ نَفْسِهِ And what ignorance does the ignorant person have if he's not content with himself? I.e. your friend who is not a scholar and is not, has not studied Islam, but they're like, I have a whole lot of work to do. That is someone who will elevate you. That's the, that's the type of person to keep company with. But the scholar, even a scholar who is satisfied with the way they are, one should stay away from them. One should stay away from them. It's very scary. So again, the foundation of this discussion is to know yourself and to be dissatisfied with where, with where we are. And... Uh, and, and this is the great road to, to triumph. So, so uh, getting right into the, to the discussion then, uh, as we said, there's over 100, so we're only going to touch upon a few. Uh, the first one actually, can anyone guess what's the 
what's the worst vice possible? So yeah, kufr. Kufr is the first one because it's this is the worst. There's an interesting discussion in in theology, uh, in Western theology, about faith versus lack of faith. Is it considered a virtue or not? Is it, is it a discussion in virtue ethics or not? Why, why do they have that conversation? Because some Western theologians considered faith to be something that you don't have a choice in. You either, your belief is something that once you recognize it, you believe it. And if you don't recognize it, you don't believe it. So there's not much of a decision. It's rather a, a cognitive thing. Can you recognize something or not? So based on that perspective, based on that perspective, they said, they said faith is not a virtue. Faith is merely, a, it's an epistemological thing. It's a cognitive thing. Do you recognize it as true or do you not recognize it as true? How can you be held accountable for that? So the Islamic response is that it is a virtue. It's the greatest virtue, iman. And its opposite, kufr, is the worst vice. It's the worst crime. Why is there a moral component to it? Because there's something above and beyond recognition. There's something above and beyond recognition, which is what, what's the name of the religion? Submission. It's not only recognizing that something is true, but it's actually submitting yourself and accepting it in your heart. So it's not simply cognitive, but it's also spiritual. And this is why the qalb is the seat of, of, rec of iman. It's not the dimagh. The dimagh is not where iman is. The, the qalb is where iman is. The dimagh recognizes, it, it, it engages in you know, cognitive functions. It learns. It, 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 it uh, processes information. But the heart either submits to what it, what it knows to be true or holds, 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 holds back. And so that holding back to ultimate reality, that's what kufr is. It's once you recognize, it's once a person recognizes truth and they refuse to submit. Whereas Islam or Iman is to actually, it's, a, it's called a movement of the soul. Once the soul recognizes, once the mind recognizes truth, the, the oneness and existence, existence and oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is evident in, in, in creation, then just does the soul submit? Does it move? It's like a sajda. Does it go down? Like the soul is qa'im normally, it's standing. Does it actually make sajda to submit to that truth? Or does it refrain? Does it hold back? Because it's for whatever ulterior uh, motives that it has. So that's why kufr is the is the first and the worst vice from a moral perspective from the Islamic tradition. Okay, if any of you come across this discussion in Western uh, theology, you'll you'll see, you'll 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 see how how they, they many of them uh, limit it to a epistemological discussion, whereas we have this we consider it a virtue as well, and and this is why a translation is very tricky. Like we often translate kufr as disbelief. Disbelief in English can be used for something that it's just too much to believe. Like he was in a, like shock almost. He was in disbelief about that thing. Where, so when we, and, and also iman, if we translate it as faith, faith has a, it's a very, it's a very loaded term in English. You know, faith in English actually has to do more with trust and confidence. Do you have faith in God? Yeah, I trust God. Well, that in our tradition, that's tawakkul. Iman is based off of, it's not simply tawakkul. It's, actually, it's, it's like we said, the submission of the soul to what it knows with certainty. It's submission of the soul to what it knows with certainty. So there is a, there's the knowledge aspect, which is certitude. It's not, that's why in the West they have this thing. I'm, I'm trying not to go on the tangent, but I can't resist. <laughs> they have this thing in the West, like Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard talks about the leap of faith. He says, if you want to have faith, you have to leap past reason because reason, religion is outside of reason. And then this is coming from a lot of baggage in Western philosophy of the proofs of God and what Kant ostensibly disproved the proofs of God. But in any case, Kierkegaard's way of dealing with it is that fine, reason is on one side and religion is on another side. And to, to become a person of faith, you have to leap out of reason and embrace religion. In our tradition, no. Religion 
and revelation is grounded in reason, like it's rational. We, can, we actually have proofs, logical demonstrations for Allah's oneness, for Allah's existence, for Allah's attributes that we affirm. And we, we can show that kufr is a contradiction. Kufr is a contradiction, that the world comes from nothing. This is a contradiction. And, and for, for temporal contingent existence to be absent uh, or not be based in necessary existence is a, is a contradiction. But in any case, Iman in our tradition is there's no, there's no leap. The leap is with tawakkul. The leap is with relying on Allah once you believe in Him. But with Iman, it's rooted in certainty. We have certainty in Allah's oneness. We have certainty in the prophecy of our Prophet ﷺ. And then does the soul submit or not? That's the movement of the soul for Iman. So we have a unique conception of Iman and Kufr in our tradition. We're not going to go through the details of Imam Nahlawi's discussion on Kufr because that would be an entire Aqidah course, which inshallah perhaps we can do in the, in the future. Um, but suffice it to say that he starts there because this is uh, the most important thing in virtue ethics. And we can, we, can, we can take from this that it behooves everyone to learn their aqidah. So it's, it's an obligation on everyone to find a qualified teacher and to study the Sunni creed and to learn not simply the the basic attributes, but the, the reasons why we believe in these attributes and the, and, the, and the rationality behind them. As we said, it's rooted in rationality. And, and, and so a person ha is grounded in their iman. Okay? And to know, because these, they're very important, um, like in the life of the believer, there's a lot of important, all of it is an extension of aqidah. Every, every experience of the believer is an extension of aqidah. Like tawakkul, for example, is an extension of one's iman in Allah's qudra, in Allah's power, one's faith in Allah's will, one's faith in the qada and the qadr. The qada and the qadr is very real in the life of the believer. The Prophet ﷺ walks into the house once and Anas, Allah be pleased with him, broke something, like a dish or something. And some of the Ahlul Bayt, some of the family were, were getting upset at Sayyidina Anas that he broke something. They didn't have a lot of material possessions and so one of the few is broken. And the, the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, walks inside and he simply smiles and he says, Qudiya. He says it was decreed, pre-eternally decreed. And so the, the Qada and the Qadr is manifesting in even the simplest of actions in the lives of people of Allah. Right, so so it's very important that we and not even if we've studied aqidah once or twice to have a constant review of our aqidah at least once a year, a person should review their aqidah mm -hmm. ideally with the teacher because uh, one one really needs to be grounded. Uh, all of what our teachers taught is all of one's re relationship with Allah it, it emerges out of our creed. All of the, all, the entire journey of drawing nearer to Allah is an extension of one's aqidah. The aqidah unfolds in one's life, in, 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 in uh, devotion to Allah. The second one is jahl. So ignorance. Ignorance is a vice. It's a, it's a very dangerous uh, crime in Islam or vice in Islam. And he defines it, he says that it's, it's, Adamul ilm amman min shatnihi an yakun alima. So he, he says it's not simply the lack of knowledge, but it's the lack of knowledge from someone who can know. So he excludes, for example, animals and inanimate objects. We wouldn't say that the table is ignorant. We wouldn't say that the water is ignorant. We wouldn't say that the cow is ignorant. We say that the human or the jinn is ignorant. So the, the, what in, in, in English is called a privation, not a negation. A privation is when something has the potential to do it, but it's not actualized, as opposed to uh, a negation where it just doesn't have the potential. So ignorance pertains to human beings and the jinn. And uh, what's really important is that there's two types of ignorance, and everyone should know this. There's two types of ignorance. There's 
jahl basit and jahl murakkab so there's simple ignorance jahl basit and murakkab compounded ignorance compounded ignorance what's the difference simple ignorance is one does not know when one does not know something and they know that they don't know it so for example i think we would all agree that we have simple ignorance of is anyone here a quantum physicist okay alhamdulillah so we all, we all have simple simple ignorance of quantum physics quantum indeterminacy the particles apparently coming out of nowhere although what's really cool about the quantum world is it just shows that allah is the creator of everything because it shows that the the normal laws of physics are not necessary laws they break down in the quantum world so what the what the theologians called the hukam adi just the normal patterns of allah's creation with the laws of physics and what are called laws of nature they're not fixed absolute laws in our aqida we study this the quantum world showed it to the physicists because everything breaks down in the quantum world so in any case we have we have simple ignorance of quantum mechanics and quantum physics what's the point though why is it called simple ignorance because we fully admit without any pretensions without any uh misgivings that we are ignorant of this I and mean, that's something i don't know no problem the ulama say this type of ignorance is very easy to to treat when the person is willing to learn if it's something if it's a knowledge that they need especially this knowledge or any worldly knowledge that one needs then it's it's simply a matter of facilitating the means of education so simple ignorance is very easy to treat the second type of ignorance though compounded ignorance is compounded why because a the person doesn't know the thing but it's compounded with their thought that they know it so they think they know it or they don't realize that they're ignorant of it so this is the case with many muslims with respect to the religion and many non-muslims many people around the globe today have a deep dangerous compounded ignorance of our religion is that they don't know its reality and they think they know a lot about it and so this is very difficult to treat this is very which is why we started with introspection we said the very beginning of this journey is introspection so one must ask themselves like like we talked about aqida that everyone needs to do introspection and ask themselves do i know my aqida have i studied the aqida of ahl sunnah the creed the sunni creed with the teacher from a to z it's not like a long several hundred page dissertation that you have to do it's a, you can cover small texts in our tradition but have i gone through our aqida with a qualified teacher am i reviewing it regularly so i'm grounded in my aqida so compounded ignorance is so we need to ask ourselves do we have compounded ignorance are we unaware of our lack of knowledge of something and uh obviously this is difficult to treat because most people do not have introspection most people are not honest with themselves which is why it's related that hazrat isa alayhi salam prophet jesus alayhi salam he said that he says that by the power of allah i was able to cure the leper and by the power of allah i was able to heal the blind and by the power of allah i was even able to raise the dead into life again raise the living from the dead he says but as for jahan murakkab as for compounded ignorance i'm at a complete loss how to treat it i have no idea how to treat it this is as it's related that hazrat isa alayhi salam he can do all those other wonders by allah's permission but this is really really difficult to treat and we see like you know the the catastrophes that are unfolding in the ummah is because of the root of it what's the root of this is people thinking that they're acting on the behalf of islam and they're really representing shaitan that's what's happening people that are that these are the the people that are using violence as a way of expressing their islam this is the hadith says they are kilabun nar the people that kill fellow muslims that kill innocent non muslims at the end of time that these people emerge the like the khawarij the neo khawarij they're kilabun nar according to the hadith these are the dogs of the fire they're the dogs of the fire is hadith that foretold that these people would come and and just indiscriminate violence and terrorism this is all haram and it's actually from shaitan and these are the awliya of shaitan we have to be very clear 
The people that do this are the friends of the devil. They're not the friends of Allah at all. But what's the root problem? The root problem is compounded ignorance. Because in their minds, they think that they're implementing the sunnah or the seerah, right? With, they have no sanad. They have, they have never studied with teachers back to the Prophet wasallam. They've never studied with people who are warathatul anbiya, the heirs of the Prophets. They have no talaqi, they have no suhba, they have no murabbi, they have no murshid, they have no mentor, they have no teacher, they have nothing. They're completely divorced from this tradition. But they cut and paste from the Qur'an or the sunnah and then they think that they're serving the religion. But what, so that they have the worst compounded ignorance. Like we can appreciate why Imam Nahlawi put this right after Kufr. We can appreciate why Imam Nahlawi listed this right after Kufr. Ignorance as a vice, especially compounded ignorance. There's a statement here in which he says that in al jahl, one of the masters says, in al jahl aqrabu ila al kufr. Min bayad al ain ila sawadiha. You know, verily ignorance, especially compounded, is closer. It's closer to disbelief than the white of the eye to the pupil. It's closer to disbelief than the white of the eye to the pupil. It's just one step, one step away. So, and what what's happening? Without going into the tangent of these groups, terroristic groups, and uh, 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 that, they, that they, it's not only one step away from kufr for themselves, but it's, it's causing kufr in the world. It's causing kufr in the world. So people see that, they associate it with Islam f falsely, and then it reinforces either their disbelief or it, people of faith are questioning their own belief. And so the, look how jahl leads to uh, disbelief. We ask Allah for afiyah for ourselves and this blessed ummah and to cure this disease and to cure this, uh, the manifestations of this, of this evil disease. So that's the, that's the second one. And there's a lot of beautiful narrations about the virtue of seeking knowledge. And we'll just share one narration that it's related that uh, Abu Naim relates in his Hilyat al Awliya that the companion Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Allah be pleased with him, and he is the Imam of Halal and Haram in our Ummah. Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Imam al Halal al Haram. He's the, he's the master of lawful and prohibited in our Ummah. So it's fitting that Allah is allowing us to, allowing us to learn from him in this meeting. He says, a lengthy hadith, ta'allamu al-ilm, learn sacred knowledge. فَإِنَّ تَعَلُّمَهُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى خَشْيَةً Because learning it for the sake of Allah is awe of Allah. Learning it for the sake of Allah is awe of Allah. It's khashya. And this is what the reality of ilm is. In our tradition, the reality of ilm makes a person humbled and awed in front of Allah. It, and, and it's not something that, you know, if one finds that the ego is growing because of knowledge, then it's, it's not knowledge. It's information, and it's a trick of the devil. So knowledge should humble the person. Knowledge should make the person feel weak vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or humbled. فَإِنَّ تَعَلُّمَهُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى خَشْيَةً وَطَلَبُهُ عِبَادًا And seeking knowledge is worship. Seeking knowledge is worship. If a person seeks knowledge, whether attending a gathering, whether studying at home, this is better than praying extra rakahs. It's better than extra nawafil, all the other types of nawafil. Especially now, what's really interesting, this is Imam, this is Hazrat Mu'ad bin Jabal saying it in the beginning of Islam. This is most applicable today when the, major, then the fundamental crisis of the ummah is jahl. When the fundamental crisis of the ummah is lack of knowledge, then this is certainly, in our times, the best ibadah. 
Seeking knowledge is the best ibadah. Facilitating institutions of knowledge is the best charity. Anything that goes back to knowledge in our times is the best way to Allah. This is really important. Besides one's obligations and personal devotion, this is the best extra way to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's the kifaya right now. This is the communal obligation right now. And in fact, one of our teachers said that he was reading from a classical text in which the sheikh from two centuries ago was telling his students that if you are uh, pursuing outward knowledge of the religion and you find that your intention is not right and that you're enjoying the... They didn't have microphones back then, but microphone fever and uh, being in the, in the spotlight and you know just the fame that comes with knowledge. He was telling his students, if you, if you find yourself, he says, then leave it completely. Leave knowledge completely and go and disassociate from it so you can fix your soul before pursuing that. And, and our teacher that was reading this text, he pauses and he says that the Imam was talking for his time. He says the Imam was talking for his time and that, that, that was true in his time. He says but in our time, because of the mass ignorance in the Ummah, if a person has learned knowledge and they're qualified to teach, and they start teaching and they still find some fault in their intention, they're not fully there, they should still teach, despite what they're finding. And he says, because the fard kifaya, the communal global obligation of teaching people that are ignorant, takes precedence over one's own challenges, internal difficulties that they're facing, struggles of the ego. And that because if they stick with it, for the sake of Allah to, to, to cure this global disease of ignorance, then with that intention, the barakah of that will inshallah fix their personal thing over time. That they keep on doing it despite, not to belittle ones, one should still work on themselves diligently, one should be very concerned with that, but the point is not to quit in our time. It's not, it's not the time everyone needs to be doing their part, even if they're struggling in their, in their heart. And so we ask Allah for afiyah. So, talabuhu ibadah, seeking knowledge is, is itself worship. Wa mudhakaratuhu tasbih, reviewing knowledge is saying subhanallah. When the student reviews with fellow students, like study groups and reviewing it, whether on one's own or when, with one's fellow students to make sure they understood, filling in the gaps in one's understanding, re revising it, trying to memorize it. This is all subhanallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, it's all dhikrullah. This is all dhikrullah. This is Hazrat Mu'adh bin Jabal. Wal bath anhu jihad. And then re researching knowledge is, is combat for Allah. It's jihad. It's that struggle. Wa ta'alimuhu liman la ya'lam sadaqa. And teaching it to someone that doesn't have that knowledge is charity. Teaching it to someone that doesn't have that knowledge is charity. Wa badluhu li ahlihi qurba. And uh, spending it on its possessors is drawing near to Allah. Spending it on for its possessors is drawing near to Allah. لِأَنَّهُ مَعَالِمُ الْحَلَالُ وَالْحَرَامُ Because it contains the signposts of the lawful and prohibited. وَمَنَارَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ And it is the lighthouse for the people of paradise. وَالْأُنْسُ فِي الْوَحْشَةِ It is the intimate companion when one is alone. وَالصَّاحِبْ فِي الْغُرْبَةِ It is one's companion when one is estranged. وَال Muhaddith fil khalwa, it is one's speaking partner when one is alone. Wa dalil ala sarra wa darra. And it is, uh, it clarifies the causes of joy and the causes of misfortune. Wa silah ala al a'da, it is the defense against enemies. Wa deen and al ajilla, it is one's religion when amongst masters. Wa zain and al akhilla, it is one's adornment amongst friends. Yarfa Allah ta'ala bihi aqwama, Allah raises people, peoples because of knowledge. Wa yaja'alahum fil khayri qada, and Allah makes them leaders of, of ethics. Wa imma, wa imma, and imams. Taqtabis atharuhum. Their, their, their footsteps are followed, are sought out, and their, their actions are emulated. 
and their opinion is sought out. تَرْغَبُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ فِي خِلَّتِهِمْ Angels seek their company. وَبِأَجْنِحَتِهَا تَمْسَحُهُمْ and angels anoint them with their wings. Angels anoint the people of knowledge with their wings. يُسْتَغْفَرْ لَهُمْ كُلُّ رَطْبٍ وَيَابِسْ Every living wet vegetation and dried vegetation asks forgiveness for the people of knowledge. حَتَّى الْحِيْتَانِ فِي الْبَحَرِ Even the whales in the seas, the fish in the sea, وَهَوَامُهُ And its creatures, وَسِبَعُ الطَّيْرِ and predatory birds, وَنَعَمُهُ and, and all sorts of uh, birds on the ground, they all seek forgiveness. لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمِ حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبِ حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبِ مِنَ الْجَهْلِ Because knowledge is the life of hearts from ignorance. وَمِسْبَاحُ الْأَبْصَارِ مِنَ الظُّلُمِ And it is the lamp of eyes, insights. Yeah. It is the lamp of insights from tyranny. يَبْلُغْ بِالْعِلْمِ مَنَازِلَ الْأَخْيَارِ وَالدَّرَجَةَ الْعُلْيَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ By knowledge one can reach the highest stations of the elect and the highest ranks in this world and the next. وَالتَّفَكُّرْ فِيهِ يَعْدِلُ بِالسِّيَامِ Reflecting on knowledge is like fasting. وَمُدَارَسَتُهُ بِالْقِيَامِ And studying with someone is like... Uh, Night prayer. Bihi tusalul arham. Because of knowledge, families can be united. Wa yu'raful halalu min al haram. And the lawful can be distinguished from the prohibited. Imamul ummal. It is the imam of the people who do act actions. Wa la amal tabi'uhu. And action follows knowledge. Yulhamuhu as suada. Wa yuhramuhu al ashqiya. The people of paradise are inspired with knowledge. And the people destined to the hell are forbi forbidden knowledge. So a sign that Allah wants de uh, their destiny to be, that, their des that Allah has de desti destined them for paradise is Allah inspires them to love knowledge. And even if a person, not, obviously not everyone can become a student of knowledge full-time or a, or a scholar, but to just love knowledge and to, and to always be connected with knowledge and to serve the people of knowledge and to support the institutions of knowledge. Everyone in our own capacity has to find a way to connect with the uh, what the Prophet has left us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third one is Hub Riyasa. The third sin of the heart is love of prestige. Love of prestige. Hub al Jah wa Riyasa al Dunyawiya. Love of prestige, love of authority, love of fame, love of reputation. And it's interesting, of course, why he would put this after jahl, because if, if a person starts treating their jahl, they can fall into this. The moment you start learning knowledge, and you start thinking that you deserve prestige, or you might get prestige, and, uh, and then that's, that's, a, that's the... Uh, Imam Ghazali says that ridding the heart from this is the last stage before a person is a Siddiq. Ridding the heart of this disease of love of prestige is the final stage before a person becomes a Siddiq, the highest level of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, of, and this, this disease, hubb riyasa love of fame, it, has, it, it applies in everyone's uh, domain where Allah has put them. So in your own social circle, for example, your desire to be the most popular or your desire to be the, most, the one with the most authority or your desire to be the most influential, right? That's one of the most difficult things on the ego is to not have influence, is to want to assert yourself and no one really cares. In fact, some say that, some, some psychologists will say that to be, when people are rude to you, that's easier than if they just ignore you or don't give you, don't value you. Actual experience of rudeness can be more easier on the nafs, on the ego, than just indifference. Indifference is the most difficult thing for the ego. And so this is the disease of, of not wanting to, that, that, you're in, that people are indifferent to you, to, to want to be uh, influential. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as related by Tirmidhi, مَا ذِئْبَانِ جَائِعَانِ أُرْسِلَا فِي غَنَمٍ بِأَفْسَدَ لَهَا 
من حرس المرء على المال والشرف لدينه. This is a very, very uh, powerful and frightening statement of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says that two wolves, two ravenous wolves, two ravenous wolves that are extremely hungry and ready to eat, if they're released amongst sheep, if they're released amongst sheep, the harm that they cause those sheep is not worse than a person's love of wealth and prestige, what that does to his heart. If This is the Prophet ﷺ saying, if two ravenous wolves were released amongst sheep, then the harm that they would do to the sheep is not worse, it's not more harmful than what, uh, what the, the, the avidness of a person for wealth and the avidness for a person for prestige does, afwan, not to the heart, to his religion, what it does to his deen, how it destroys his religion because of what it does to the heart. So that's sufficient for us to, uh, to take it seriously. Imam Nahlawi mentions three causes three causes of this disease. The first one he says, and he calls it, and this is from taken from Ghazali, he calls it Malik al It's the king of hearts. Hubb al is the king of hearts because it dominates the hearts. So, so nothing can dominate the heart, i.e. the ego, like love of prestige. Its causes are, are three. The first is At-Tawassul bil ila ma hurrima min mushtahayat al-nafs wa muradatiha wa hadha haram. So the first cause, or the first type, you could say, the first type of love of prestige is when prestige is used as a means to satisfy illicit pleasures and desires of the lower self. This is unlawful. So if, if one seeks prestige and influence so that they can do something haram, then that, be, that makes that love haram. Okay, loving to be famous, loving to be influential so that they can do something unlawful is itself an unlawful love of prestige. The second type is, and I'll just read the English inshallah for time's sake. The, the second type is using prestige as a means to either secure a right to attain something recommended or permissible, to combat oppression, or to uh, remove distractions from worship, to free oneself of worship as a means to fulfill a duty, as a means of strengthening the religion, as a means of rectifying people by commanding the good, forbidding the evil. So, i.e., situations where one loves to be influential for something, the goal of which in and of itself is either, uh, it's, it's good, it's a positive thing, or to ward off an evil thing. So for example, a person wants to gain influence so that they can raise money to build an institution that will serve society, serve humanity, do something good for a good cause, or to secure a right. So a person, so, someone is withholding a right from you, so you seek prestige and influence so that you can get your right back or uh, or to so to do anything either to fulfill one's own right fulfill someone else's right or to uh, strengthen the, the the religion what what's the ruling for this type of love of prestige this love of prestige is permissible that love of gaining influence to do something good or to ward off a bad is permissible with conditions. The conditions are what? There is no prohibition associated with it, such as riya, ostentation, or talbis, deception. So there's no deception involved when you're trying to garner support and increase your prestige, you're honest. Another condition, there's no riya, you're not showing off in that. So while, even though the cause might be good, and so the, the fuqaha are saying that your love of prestige is therefore permissible, but if it's coupled with showing off to others that you're the one, and you want others to know how you're doing this good, you want others to know uh, in your heart, that's, that's, that's the, the, the motive. So it's not sincerely for Allah, 
the motive is ostentation to show off this good project that you're working on, then it's not permissible. This love of prestige is not permissible. But if it's free from ostentation, if it's free from deception, uh, and it does not entail omitting so, uh, something mandatory or, or an emphasized sunnah of the religion, so you're not sacrificing your own religious practice for the sake of it, then it's permissible or perhaps recommended. It could even be recommended. So there's situations when love of prestige is actually recommended. It's free of other diseases of the heart. You're honest and you're not sacrificing your own religious practice. And the ultimate telos, the ultimate aim for which you're trying to gain popularity is something that's good or warding, warding off a bad. Okay? Then it can be, what, what are the, some of the examples or proofs that this type of wanting to be influential is a positive thing that the dua in the Quran, that uh, Surah Al Furqan, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wadriyatina qurata ayun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Okay, O Allah, gift to us uh, from your, uh, for that, for that our spouses and our children are the coolness of our eyes. And then the end of the dua, wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama, and make us leaders. Make us leaders of the righteous. Make us leaders of the righteous. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama. That Imam Zaid relates that he, uh, one of the Westerners came to Sham, may Allah heal Sham, and, uh, and wanted to study. And so they, wanted, they didn't know Arabic yet, so they, but they wanted to meet Sheikh Abdurrahman Shahuri, rahimahullah. And so Imam Zaid took the, the student uh, to meet the sheikh and uh, so Imam Zaid was translating and the student says that you know I came here to learn my deen but I'm not trying to become a scholar or anything I just want to learn my fard ain, the basic obligations of the religion just and that's it and Sheikh Abdul Rahman Shahuri Rahimullah he says why don't you want to be a scholar why don't you want to be a scholar? And then he cites that this ayah. He says, Allah Ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama." Allah says that make us leaders of the, of the righteous. This is a dua that we should say. So, so that shows that's, that's an example of the second type of loving influence. If you want to be influential for the sake of Allah, the, the ultimate aim is not just your, your ego to get bigger, but it's something good that you're trying to do or some harm that you're trying to stop. And in the process, you don't have any of these other diseases, deception, ostentation, uh, then it's, it can be a good thing. And it is a good thing. And we, we should seek influence for that sake. Again, now contextualize it in our times. Dealing with the fard kifaya, dealing with the crisis of ignorance that we have, everyone should be influential. <laughs> everyone should, should, this is highly recommended for all of us. We should all seek influence through social media, through whatever avenues we can, through writing, the pen. Many shiuch would tell their students, the pen, this is the great tool of knowledge, that everyone should be active writing. You know, like, like there's all these comment sections on, on, on different websites where people say all sorts of ridiculous things and obnoxious things. And, you know, like, don't wait for a scholar to come and, Everyone should, you know, you, if you go to that website, you find a website, just put, put a little paragraph in just to clarify the religion, to, to, to de defend the honor of the Prophet wasallam. You know, the people who are really our scholars, they don't have the time or the, you know, they're doing very, very big projects. They can't, with, with, uh, the rest of us, that we, if we're spending 45 minutes just surfing the net anyways, maybe spend three minutes doing something for Allah. <laughs> and then and then do 42 minutes for the nafs. At least do three minutes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yeah, no, influence. So use whatever avenues that you have, uh, you know, to, to, to defend our religion in, the, in this global crisis of ignorance. So this is a positive type of love of prestige, love of influence, love of fame. Try to be famous for the sake of Islam. Suleiman al-Islam made the dua, my Lord, grant me a kingdom that is unfit, for anyone after me. So he wanted this huge kingdom. That's a lot of prestige. But again, he's, he has perfect intention. It's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Another example, Prophet Yusuf Islam, when he's asked by the 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 ruler of Egypt, you know, what 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 uh, what what can you do? And he says, "Jalni ala khazain al ard," like place me on on in charge of the treasure stores of the earth, right? Inni uh, hafidun uh, alim. I am. He explains why should why should I get this? Why should you put me in this position? Because I am, I am qualified. Hafiz, I can do a good job. I can guard it. Alim, I have an expertise. I have knowledge. And like your resume, this is like the resume, right? And so the the you you can you can have an awesome resume if it's for a positive job, and you're doing it for the sake of Allah. And Bismillah. So, the third type of love of prestige is just to when you enjoy prestige in and of itself. When you enjoy prestige in and of itself, and you think it's a good thing, just like if someone loves wealth to attain pleasurable things. So. This, he says, Imam Nahlawi says, Rahimullah, as long as there's no prohibitions in t- involved, then it's technically not haram, but it's blameworthy. Okay, so if a person likes prestige or likes wealth in and of itself, but it's not for any haram. They don't like prestige for to do something haram. They don't like wealth to do something haram. It's just they enjoy. It's something of the dunya that they enjoy. Then it's they're not in sin, but it's very blameworthy, and so uh, and and of course it's a slippery slope. We can just add that that it's a very slippery slope. So one should um, combat that, but uh, it becomes haram when it's used for something haram, and Allah knows best. The cure, he says is to realize that prestige is by no means a virtue because it's so temporary and its reality is so dismal. The most potent method for overcoming the desire for prestige is seclusion from people to a place of obscurity. So the medicine, if a person finds this disease in their heart, the medicine is to seek a place where they're not famous, a place where they're, or a context where they're not popular, where they're not special. If there are certain settings where you're very special, then the cure for whatever is happening in the heart is to go to settings where you're not special. And this is, again, this is very difficult for the ego. This is why Ibn Atala, what does he say? Rahimullah, he says, Idfan wujudika fi ard al He says, bury your entire existence in the earth of obscurity. Bury your entire existence in the ground and the soil of obscurity. Khumul. Because that which grows without having been buried will not give complete fruit. That which grows without having been buried deep will not give complete fruit. So if you just, if you take like, if you barely move a little bit of topsoil and put a seed there, what, what's it going to make? A little small. Whereas if you plant it deep and you cultivate it, then you get this big tree and fruits and blossoming. So similarly with obscurity. And this is why the hadith, look at the hadith of our Prophet ﷺ. That, uh, Allah said it to Muhammad. Uh, Hakim relates in his Mustadrak, and it's a sahih hadith, authentic hadith, that the Prophet says ﷺ, uh, Al-Yasiru min al Shirk. Al Yasiru min riyai shirk. Even a little bit of ostentation is like idolatry. Even a little bit of showing off with one's religion is like idolatry. And the ulama clarify it's not actual kufr, but it's it's like it because one is made 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 a partner uh, seeking the pleasure of someone else instead of only Allah's pleasure. But it's a sin of the heart, it's not it's not actual kufr. So in al yasir min al riya'i shirk. No, the Prophet continues, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa in Allah wa man aada awliya Allah, fakad bar az Allah bil muharaba. 
And whoever shows animosity to the people that Allah loves, that the awliya of Allah, then they have laid down the gauntlet and challenged Allah to combat. Whoever shows animosity to the people that Allah loves, the awliya of Allah, they have laid down the gauntlet and challenged Allah to combat. This is the only, there's only two sins in Islam that Allah says He wages war against them. One is consuming riba, the other is offending or harming a wali of Allah. And, and, and we don't know who the awliya are, so we should never harm anyone. We should never harm any Muslim because that Muslim could be a great wali of Allah. We, shouldn't har we should never harm a non-Muslim because that, that person could become a wali of Allah. We don't know their end. And even uh, in their state, they have rights. Every, every fellow human has rights, so it's ha haram, it's prohibited to harm one's fellow man. But the, uh, a question is, look at that hadith, why are the two related? Why did the Prophet ﷺ mention the animosity to the awliya right after saying the slightest bit of riya is like idolatry? And one of the reasons is that, and Allah knows best, is that the awliya are the ones that have no riya. The slightest bit of riya is like idolatry. So what becomes of a person who has no riya? They're at a level that whoever offends them, Allah, they've challenged a lot of fighting. That's the fruit, one of the fruits of being someone who does not have riya. And the hadith continues, which is relevant, pertinent to our discussion now. That وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبْ الْأَبْرَارِ الْأَتْقِيَاءِ الْأَخْفِيَاءِ And verily Allah loves the righteous, the people of bir, the people of taqwa, the people who do good and who refrain from evil. Bir is to do good, taqwa to refrain from evil. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبْ الْأَبْرَارِ الْأَتْقِيَاءِ الْأَخْفِيَاءِ And the people who are obscure, the Prophet says. Allah loves the people who are obscure. How does he describe them? He, the hadith continues, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says that, إِذَا حَدَرُوا لَمْ يُعْرَفُوا When they attend a gathering, they're not noticed. When they attend a gathering, there are nobodies in the gathering. وَإِذَا غَابُوا لَمْ يُفْتَقَدُوا And when they're not in the gathering, they're not missed. They're not noticed if they're absent. The Prophet is commenting the people that Allah loves, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, قُلُوبُهُمْ مَصَابِيحُ الْهُدَى He says their hearts are lamps of guidance. Their hearts are lamps of guidance, the nobodies of the community. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْ كُلِّ غَبْرَاءَ مُظْلِمَةً يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْ كُلِّ غَبْرَاءَ مُظْلِمَةً They get out of every dark wasteland. They get out of every dark wasteland. Meaning what? Meaning every trial that afflicts, afflicts the people, Allah gives them a way out where they're unharmed. Allah gives them a way out where they're unharmed. And so the people who are not in the spotlight are in the divine light. And so this is the cure. It's like, why should I love prestige? I'd rather be with Allah. That's the point. We should rather be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under His light. So... <coughs> He concludes, Imam Nahlawi concludes the, the section saying, after the cure being the going to a place of obscurity, he says, having said that, prestige in and of itself is not blameworthy. This is really important. What's the disease? Love of prestige. The love of prestige is a disease, right? And it's either blameworthy or unlawful or recommended, depending, as we said, the three types. But he's saying prestige in and of itself. If Allah gives someone prestige, there's nothing wrong with that. Prestige and fame in and of itself. A lot of people make this mistake. How could he be a sheikh? Look at He has a thousand likes on Facebook, which is not even that much, I think. <laughs> How could he be a sheikh? He has a Facebook. No, a sheikh can have a Facebook. He has a hundred thousand likes. He has a million. Yani Allah can give prestige. Prestige, there's nothing wrong with prestige. And look what he says. Having said that, prestige in and of itself is not blameworthy as long as one is not avid for it, as long as one is not avid for it. He says, look at his proof. For what prestige is greater than that of prophets, alayhi 
who has more prestige than the Prophet and of course the best of creation, our Prophet who has more prestige than the rightly guided caliphs. What happens to the heart when you hear the name Abu Bakr? What happens to the heart when you hear the name Hazrat Uthman? We still say Prophet Yusuf and you just, just imagine, you know, being in the presence of a Prophet, being in the presence of a rightly guided. What happened? Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now what, this is cosmic prestige. <laughs> Sorry. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Allah and the angels are sending blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What more prestige? There's not a hand span in the heavens, in the seven co- uh, heavens, except there's an angel worshipping Allah, meaning an angel also sending salawat. They're sending salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Himself. Yani what more prestige do you need? Allah Himself sending salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, the, the prestige in and of itself, fame in and of itself, is not a negative thing. And he says that indeed their fame was the greatest of fame, their glory the greatest of glory, their position amongst people the greatest positioning amongst people. Yet, and here's the point for us, it was without any love or zeal to attain it for the sake of this world. There is no love of it for the sake of worldly enjoyment, just enjoying the prestige in and of itself. Now these, these were of course people uh, closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it served only to assist them in spreading the call to Allah, supporting the religion, and protecting Islam. So, <clears throat> that's his discussion of love of prestige. Uh, the fourth and the fifth are related. The fourth and the fifth are related. The fourth is khawf al dham with ta'yir, fear of blame or criticism. So this is a vice in Islam, to fear blame or criticism. And what's related, the fifth one, is hubb al madh with thana, is to love being praised, love of praise. So the two go hand in hand, to feel uncomfortable or uh, to have fear when you're criticized, and then to love when you're praised and recognized. Allah. So the great masters of our tradition, they did not fear being criticized. It's related that Hassan al-Basri, the great Imam of the Tabi'een and student of Hazrat Ali, Karam Waj, he was told, so and so spoke ill of you. How did he respond, Imam Hassan al-Basri? He, sent him a, he sends him a platter of sweets. And he writes, It has reached me that you gave me some of your good works, so I wanted to compensate you. <laughs> it has reached me that you gave me some of your good deeds, so I wanted to compensate you. Similarly, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Imam al-Azam, he was once told that someone spoke badly of him. So he sent him some gold coins. And gold, as always, is very valuable. Silver is not as valuable. Gold is perennially valuable. It's innately valuable. So he sends him some gold coins, not just silver. And he says, what does he say with him? He says, if someone gives us from their good works, we shall increasingly give them from our worldly possessions. If someone gifts us from their good deeds, then we shall give them even more, of our, so increase them more in our worldly possessions. In another narration, he sent ripe dates. He sent ripe dates to the person and he wrote to him, listen to this, Imam al-Adam, Abu Hanif rahimullah, he hears he hear someone speaks ill of him, he sends him ripe dates, he said, and he writes to him, it has reached me that you gave me some of your good deeds, so I wanted to reimburse you for that, but please pardon me for not being able to reimburse you in full. <laughs> because what comparison do dates or gold coins have to actual good deeds that are baqiyat salihat immortal good deeds? So he says, not only does he say, this is in recompense, but he says, forgive me, al-afu, yani, pardon me, it's nothing compared to what, <laughs> what you gifted me. There's actually, there's another narration that uh, Imam Baba Hanifa, rahimullah, was traveling uh, away from his, the town where he, in Kufa, where he lived, and uh, uh on in the caravan was just him and a, like a jokester 
and uh, as the, and and they were coming back home, and so the whole time in the caravan, the jokester was making fun of him. He was mocking him the whole time, and the whole time Imam Abu Hanifa was laughing with him. He was like, "That's a good one, and that's so true," and just enjoy, just having, <laughs> just going along with it, and and sort of. And then as they as they reach his hometown where he's Imam Abu Hanifa, he sa- he gets serious at the end. He says, okay, up until now, you've been joking and I'm joking with you, but we're about to get back home. And back home, everyone knows me as an imam, a scholar. And he says, if, if you ma- make fun of me then, I'll have you arrested. <laughs> if you make fun of me, in- why? It wasn't, cause it wasn't for his nafs. This is the point. When it's him alone and it's his nafs, He's slap my ego all you want. But now there's a greater maqsad, the greater point, which is if, if a scholar is mocked or made fun of or belittled, then something of the religion is being belittled. And so for the sake of Allah, he's saying now no more. And if you do it, I'll, you, you'll be in trouble. So this shows the people of Allah, it's, ne- and it's never personal. It's never personal. Their concern is Allah and the word of Allah reigning. Kalimatullah, hi al So... Uh, fear of blame and uh, and uh, love of being praised. These are, these go together. And there's a beautiful um, statement to that teaches us what's the root of this. Because uh, Ibn al Jalla Ibn al Jalla was a early master of Damascus, third or fourth century, early master of Damascus, and very very profound Imam. If you, if you get a chance to read his biography and what happened to him as a child, it's very interesting, but time doesn't allow. So Ibn al-Jalla, he, he once says that uh, مَنْ إِسْتَوَى عِنْدَهُ الْمَدْحُ وَالذَّمْ فَهُوَ زَاهِد مَنْ إِسْتَوَى عِنْدَهُ الْمَدْحُ وَالذَّمْ فَهُوَ زَاهِد Which means whoever, it's the same to them, whether they're praised by others, or criticized by others, whoever for them it's the two are equivalent, that is the Zahid. That's the person detached from the dunya. That's the person detached from the dunya. Meaning Zuhud, this ethic of being indifferent to this world and detached from this world, it's not simply with material possessions. The Zahid is not simply who who wears uh, you know inexpensive clothes. The Zahid is not someone who necessarily uh, has, you know, uh, who lives in, a t- uh, in, in poverty. The Zahid is not someone necessarily who has l- less material possessions. The, za- the true Zahid, the true person who is detached from this dunya, is the person who, whether they're praised or blamed, it's equivalent. They're, they're, they're detached from people's impression of them. This is real Zuhud. And so this is a true measure for us. Because a person of Allah can have many material possessions. Sulaiman was one of the richest ever, if not the richest ever. But he was a Zahid, he's Imam of Zuhad. He's Imam of people that are not interested in this world because his richness was for the sake of Allah. And like we talked about love of prestige, love of wealth is similar. Love of wealth, if, it's, if, you, if you gather wealth, if you accumulate wealth for the sake of Allah, to do something good, to plant seeds for the sake of Allah, to, to, to do good with that wealth. And it's, it's, there's no deception, there's no ostentation, there's no other diseases of the heart, then it's recommended. Love of wealth could be recommended. And especially now in our time, as we said, it's actually very recommended. We need, we need very wealthy people in our community to do a lot of good. So zuhud, detachment from this dunya, is not necessarily to have little in your hand, it's to have little in your heart with respect to this world. And the pinnacle... The, the pinnacle litmus test for us, because a person might say, yeah, I don't care if I have this material possession, and I don't care if I have that material possession, but do, do we care whether we're praised or blamed? This is the litmus test of zuhud. Okay, do we care whether we're praised or blamed? Another litmus test of zuhud is how attached are we to the way we are? How attached are we to the way we are? Because if we're not struggling to improve ourselves, then we are connected, we're attached to our own personalities and the way we are and our own vices. 
So it's from zuhud, it's from detachment from dunya to be detached from your own faults. That you, that to actually hate your faults and to remove them. So there's different litmus tests for zuhud. But Ibn, Ibn Jalla, he says, Man istawa indahu al madhu wa dham fa huwa zahid. Whoever it's the same for him, whether he's praised or blamed by others, that's the true zahid. And he, to, and he continues to continue that, the, the maxim. He says, Waman addal faraid fi awal mawaqitiha fa huwa abid. And whoever fulfills religious obligations in the very first of their times, that is the true devotee. Whoever fulfills obligations in the first of their times, that's the abid. So when the prayer time comes in, are we hanging back or are we saying labbaik? This is something the people of Allah, as soon as the time comes in, when you're sure the time comes in, because there's some issues with some of the calendars, when you're sure that the time comes in, then to rush to fulfill the obligation. This is the abid. And then the third statement he says, وَمَنْ رَأَ الْأَفْعَالْ كُلَّهَا مِنَ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ مُوَحِّدٍ وَمَنْ رَأَ الْأَفْعَالْ كُلَّهَا مِنَ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ مُوَحِّدٍ لَا يَرَأَ إِلَّا وَاحِدًا And whoever sees all events and all actions in the world as Allah's actions, that's the monotheist. Whoever sees all actions in the world and all actions of fellow man as actions of Allah, that's the muwahid. لا يرى إلا واحدة. Such a person only sees one, because Allah is the one uh, acting in every event. So, put this in this context. That last part, put it in this context. When your friend, or your family member, or your someone in the community criticizes you and it hurts, who's the real actor? Who's acting in reality? Who created that person? Who created their speech? Who created their thoughts? Who, who put the notion in their mind to criticize you? Who, who put their words together to come out in a sentence? Who moved their tongue? Who created the muscle movements of the tongue for the speech to come out? Who created all the action potentials and the sodium and potential in their minds? That person can't help it. That person can't help it in a way. Like one of the, one of the things that our masters teach us, when we're dealing with fellow man, you should almost be as if they have no free will. We affirm free will. This is not. This is this is a this is a a spiritual ethic. It's not a theological conversation. In theology, every human has free will. Yeah, I need their granted choice, and Allah will take them to account for it. But in terms of me dealing with fellow man, I should I should perceive it as if they don't have a choice. Allah decreed it, so I should. There's two levels of reality. There's the surface level of sharia, and there's the deeper level of haqiqa. Okay, there's two levels of reality. The surface level of sharia, which is we're all human beings with choice and are accountable for our choices and our actions. There's a deeper level of haqiqa, which is nothing happens except that Allah decreed it and is creating it right now. And nothing happens in the world except Allah decreed it in eternity and is creating it right now. So when I look at myself, I should focus on the surface level of am I doing enough for Allah or am I falling short? Am I being lazy or am I working hard? I look at the surface level. I have, Allah gave me this choice. Am I using it or am I hanging back? When I deal with other people, I should do the deeper level. That whatever, 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 even the bad that they're doing, it's... I should, I should realize that they're decreed to do it, so I shouldn't judge them. Whatever criticism they're giving me, they, they were decreed to give that criticism. I shouldn't judge them. It's coming from Allah. It's coming from Allah. And the same when you're praised with some, by someone. If you're praised by someone, it's not Allah. Allah, see it from Allah and be humbled. Be humbled. Uh, this is the way. So... So dealing with criticism. And also part of this, Imam Nahrawi discusses that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Mu'minu Mir'atul Mu'min. Al-Mu'minu Mir'atul Mu'min. The believer is a mirror for his fellow believer. The believer is a mirror for his fellow believer. So when I'm dealing with my fellow believer, if any fault, fault that they point out in me, it's like looking in the mirror. I should be. So we started the discussion saying the people of Allah, they want to see their faults so they can work on themselves. Mm. This is actually a great blessing from Allah. 
Because if it weren't for people criticizing me, I would never know my faults and I could never improve. So the fact that so-and-so has criticized me is an opportunity to draw nearer to Allah. So if the, if, the, if the criticism is true, say Alhamdulillah and work on it. And if it's false, say Alhamdulillah that you don't have it. Uh, the next one is Bid'ah in Aqidah. Number six is Bid'ah in Aqidah. It's a very lengthy, involved discussion that we won't explore fully right now. It would take it its own two-day course. But uh, we'll just mention that... Uh, just to remind ourselves of what we started with, that to learn the creed of, of Ahlul Sunnah, because a, a belief that contravenes the Sunni uh, Aqidah is considered a bidah. And classically in our tradition, the word bidah firstly meant creed. A lot of times today it's used for actions, and it has an application with actions, but the term in our classical tradition meant, meant mostly, primarily, a creedal position. And so one should, uh, one should make sure they learn the aqidah of, ah, of Ahl sunnah So we're going to have to skip a little bit and we'll discuss, uh, inshallah, number 11. The 11th one is tama'ah. Tama'ah. Tama'ah with the ta. So ta mim ain tama'ah. So what does tama'ah mean? So, tama is covetousness. Covetousness. Uh, and he defines it, he says, tama covetousness, huwa iradatul haram al mulid, aw al shay al mukhatir. Wal mubahat min umur al dunya li isaliha ila nisyan al akhira. He says, covetousness is to desire that which is enjoyable yet unlawful. To desire something enjoyable and haram, or to desire something dangerous. What does he mean by dangerous? Something that in and of itself is good, but it leads to the haram. In and of itself is good, but it leads to the haram. So, for example, a person could have tama for doing community work, but their ultimate aim is to be known as someone that does community work. Or they could have tama for donating, but their ultimate aim is to be known as a philanthropist. So that's tama. It's coveting, so that's, that's still problematic. Coveting either something unlawful or something that's lawful or even good, but it leads to something unlawful. Or uh, permissible things, coveting permissible things. Why is that dangerous? Because it leads to forgetting the akhirah. Too much of this dunya leads to forgetting the akhirah. He says, covetousness of the unlawful is unlawful. Obviously, to desire to do haram and to covet it is unlawful. Lusting after the haram is haram. Coveting something dangerous is not unlawful but very blameworthy because it could very well lead to the unlawful. So, that's the distinction. The fiqh distinction, to covet something haram is haram. To covet something blameworthy, uh, excuse me, to covet something dangerous is blameworthy but not haram. The most vile type of covetousness, the most vile type of tama, is with respect to what others possess. This is the most vile and most evil and most disgusting type of tama, is with respect to what others possess. It is a disc disgraceful trait that arises out of worldly greed, spiritual idleness, and ignorance 
of the wisdom of Allah in creating the need for mutual assistance. This is a type of ignorance of Allah's wisdom because Allah has created the world in mutual assistance. So we need each other. There are certain things that you have that fulfill my needs and there are certain things that I have that fulfills your needs. And together, this is from the wisdom of Allah that He has d diversified His gifts in creation. So to have covet, to covet what someone else has is a jahl. It's a type of ignorance, which is how we began the conversation. One of the scholars pointed out that there's a ishara in the very word tama, because each of its letters, ta, meem, ayn, are empty, hollow, vacuous letters. There's a big fat emptiness in the middle, the ta, the meem, and the ayn. So it's just because tama is emptiness. When you covet something other than Allah and His good pleasure, you're coveting something that's empty. You're coveting something that's empty. So our, our desire should be Allah's pleasure, Allah's presence, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. So, the opposite of covetousness. What's the opposite? The opposite is tafweed, tafweed, which is translated as consigning one's affair to Allah, consigning one's affair to Allah. And this is similar to tawakkul, relying on Allah. But some ulama said tawakkul is the fruit of tafweed. Tafweed is the foundation, which is to hand it over to Allah. And when you hand it over to Allah, then you rely because he's now disposing of the affair. So tawakkul presupposes tafweed, giving it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Nahlawi says, وَدِدُّ tama." The opposite of tama is a tafweed, consignment. وَهُوَ Which is defined as iradatu an يَحْفَظَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكْ مَصَالِحَكْ Is the, for your desire that Allah preserves all of your affairs. It's your desire not for anything in the world, but your desire that Allah, your desire for Allah's disposing of your affairs, protection of your affairs. Whether dunyawi or ukhrawi, whether worldly or otherworldly, even spiritually. Like, don't take it on yourself to rid, rid yourself of any of these diseases. Consign it to Allah. Allah will, Allah will give me tawfiq, inshaAllah. Have a good opinion of Allah. Ana'inda dhanni abdi bi. Allah says in the hadith Qudsi, and Imam Muslim relates, I am in the opinion of my servant of me. Allah Ta'ala says, I am in the opinion of my servant. If we think, Man, this path is just impossible. There's just no way. I mean, even just one, you know, and look at me, I'm, I'm a rut and I, I give up. I'm in despair. There's no, you know, you start falling into despair. No, that, that, don't think of yourself and your weakness. Think of Allah's power. Allah can, can take someone who, Allah, Allah took many criminals and made them awliya. Allah took people like highway brigands in our past and made them awliya. Allah took people like, People that were so uh, involved in, in, in evil and made them the greatest. Uh, and even many of the companions, read all the, all the, biographies, of the bi biographies of the companions. Many of them were steeped in jahiliya before their Islam. So Allah can do it. Allah can fix us and rectify us. So tafweed is to, whether worldly concern or otherworldly concern, to hand it over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, <clears throat> if the matter entails benefit, Allah will facilitate it, otherwise He will withhold it. The trust Allah. Allah is the creator of outcomes. This is really important in our aqidah. There is no necessary outcome for things in the world. Okay? So, there is just habitual norms of Allah's creation. So Allah can give something despite the lack of the means. And Allah can withhold something despite possessing the means. There's no necessary connection between wealth and happiness. There's no necessary connection between 
family and happiness. There's no sense in necessary connection between popularity and happiness. And ultimately, all of these things go to happiness. <laughs> all of these things that people seek, it's ultimately for happiness. We want to feel happy. Allah can give happiness to someone that lacks all these things. They have zero means or very little means. And Allah can create so much happiness in the heart. So trust Allah as the creator of outcomes. Yeah. And he cites... Allah Ta'ala Hikayatan and Mu'min Ali Fir'aun, Allah Ta'ala states, quoting the believer of the folk of Pharaoh, Wa ufawidu amri in Allah, in Allah basirun bil ibad. Fawakahu Allahu sayyati ma makaru. Look at the conjoining. The, the believer amongst the people of Fir'aun says, I consign my affair to Allah. Verily, Allah is ever watchful of his servants. Immediately Allah Ta'ala says, Fa. So right away, without delay, Waqahullahu Sayyati Mamakuru. Allah protected him from the evil of their plotting. Like tafweed is conjoined with wiqaya. The man says, Ufawidu Amri ilallah, I consign my affair to Allah. Allah Ta'ala res responds, says immediately, Fa waqahullahu sayyati mamakru. So immediately thereafter, Allah protected. Uh, uh, safeguarded him, shielded him from the evil of their scheming. Undur kefa aqtaballahu subhanahu wa tafweed bil wiqaya. He says, reflect how Allah put immediately protection after consignment. Wa hu maqam sharif. This is a noble station. Yadullu ala husnihi an naqlu wal aqlu. Both reason and revelation indicate how noble this is. How noble this is. And we'll just conclude, inshallah, before there's any questions to read from So Ibn Atta'ala says, Rahimullah, ma basiqat aghsanu dhul illa ala badri tama'a. مَا بَسَقَتْ أَغْصَانُ ذُلْ إِلَّا عَلَى بَدْرِ طَمَعَ The branches of disgrace never sprung forth except from the seeds of covetousness. The branches of dishonor only spring forth from the seeds of tama, the seeds of covetousness. This is the source of the branches and the fruits of dishonor. And Ibn Abbad, the great Andalusian scholar, comments, Rahimullah, الطمع من أعظم آفات النفوس وعيوبها القادحة في العبوديتها He says that covetousness is of the greatest evils of the soul and its faults that contradicts one's servitude to Allah. بل هو أصل جميع الآفات In fact, Tama, covetousness is the foundation of all harms. Mm -hmm. Covetousness is the foundation of all spiritual harms. لِأَنَّهُ مَحْدُ تَعَلُّقْ بِالنَّاسِ Because it is the essence of being connected to people. It is nothing but. It is essentially being connected to people. وَالْتِجَاءِ إِلَيْهِمْ And seeking protection in them. وَاعْتِمَادْ عَلَيْهِمْ And relying on them. وَعُبُدِيَةً لَهُمْ And ultimately being devoted to them. وَفِي ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْمَذَلَّ وَالْمَهَانَ مَا لَا مَزِيدَ عَلَيْهِ And what that entails of dishonor and abasement has no match. Was that what that entails of dishonor and abasement is unparalleled. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لِلْمُؤْمِنْ أَنْ يُذِلَّ نَفْسَهُ And it's not permissible for the believer to abase himself. Based on the hadith and mu'min la yudil nafsahu, the believer does not humiliate himself. So, in this context, one should not, it's prohibited for the believer to have tama' because that's the source of all humiliation. And covetousness is the opposite, it's the contrary of the essence of iman, the reality of iman. Because iman is that which entails honor and dignity. And the dignity and honor that believers are ascribed with 
is only only takes place only takes only occurs by raising their aspirations to their master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the only door for izza look at the ummah today look how much humiliation we have look how much abasement we have we're we're like the laughing stock of the world other ummahs can find dignity from other than Allah other ummahs can find dignity from other than Allah because they don't have Allah they don't have the book of Allah they don't have the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so those doors are open for them they can find dignity through these other ism, isms all the isms of the world political ideology our ummah we we fell into political ideology and we have we're the laughing stock of the world we're a disgrace of the world what's the only way for not only individuals but the ummah to have izza in al izza lillah jamia it's only with allah it's only with allah and and so to go back to these realities like what we're trying to just get a taste of right now this is what the ummah has abandoned the tradition of virtue ethics the tradition of metaphysics the tradition of cultivating the soul so that the person is rooted so that the person is connected with Allah so the person has taqwa of Allah so the person won't cross the bounds that other political ideologies because the ends justify the means they fall into violence they fall into terrorism they fall into all these pernicious demonic means because they think that the aim justifies it and that's all mar- marxist foreign alien un-islamic thought that infiltrated it infiltrated the muslim world they abandoned our metaphysics pursued political ideology as the foundation and they they became a, a, look at the look at the mess that we're in and the only way out is to return to our tradition is to return to the tradition of ihsan metaphysics virtue ethics and then from that stems prophetic politics from that will come prophetic politics politics that reflects the 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 love of the other which is the way of our fatuwa our polit- all pro- our politics is fatuwa politics it's a politics of altruism it's a politics of loving the other it's a politics of empathy for the other it's a politics of joining hands with the other for the common good ta'alu ila kalimatin sawan it's not hatred of the other it's rooted in the haqiqa that we talked about that none of, none of this none of the things that even the enemies of islam are doing except that allah decreed it and so to see the haqiqa in the in the events so this is this is the only way of izzat for the mu'minin bi raf'i himamihim ila mawlahum is to raise their aspirations to their master and creator wa tumaninat qulubihim ilayhi and for the hearts to be comfortable with allah wa thiqatihim bihi duna man siwa and for the hearts to be confident and rely on allah besides anyone else fa hadhihi hi al izza this is true dignity allati manaha allah abduhu al mu'min that allah has gifted his believing servant qala allah ta'ala allah ta'ala states walillahi al izza walillahi al izzatu wa li rasulihi wa lil mu'minin true dignity is for god for his messenger and for the real believers wa kama anna al izzata min sifat al mu'minin kadhalika al madhalla min akhlaq al kafirin wal munafiqin and just like dignity is of the traits of believers humiliation and basement is of the akhlaq of the people who reject allah and the hypocrites qala allah ta'ala allah ta'ala states inna alladhina yuhaduna allah wa rasulahu ulaika fil adhallin those people that have uh, uh, animosity or fight uh, allah and his messenger those are the abased qala abu bakr al warraq al hakim the metaphysician abu bakr al warraq allah be pleased with them says لو قيل للطمع من ابوك قال الشك في المقدور ولو قيل له ما حرفتك قال اكتساب الذل ولو قيل ما غايتك قال الحرمان وان وذ ذس نو ون اوف ذا ميتافيزيشنز اوف اور تراديشن ابو بكر الوراق هي سايز اف طمع اف كوفتسنس وير اسكت هو از يور فادر هو از يور فادر اي اي وات جيفز بيرث تو طمع what's the cause of tama tama would say a shak fil maqdur doubting what allah has decreed mm-hmm. doubting what allah has decreed this gives birth to tama to coveting what other people have and if if tama were interviewed and asked what's your occupation what's your profession he would say iktisab iktisab adh-dhul my profession 
is to earn and acquire abasement and humiliation and dishonor. To earn dishonor. And if Tama were asked, what's your ultimate aim? What's your goal with your in endeavor? He would say al-hirman, to be blocked from Allah, to be dis disbarred and disconnected from Allah. We ask Allah Ta'ala for afiyah mm -hmm. and to protect us from such horrible ends. Mm -hmm. My question dropped. Bismillah. question is um, what you mentioned that Allah Ta'ala is the one acting in all actions if one is going through a difficult situation and they realize that this is from Allah is it wrong to assume that Allah is upset with one um, so uh, the first step if a person has a difficulty is to ask themselves, is to look internally to see if they're consistently doing something that's displeasing to Allah. If they're consistently engaged in something that's displeasing to Allah. So we all make mistakes, we all have our faults, and we, inshallah, make our regular toba from those. But if one is consistently, they're habitually engaged in something that's displeasing to Allah, then, they, then that could very well be the cause of a, a calamity. Um, if they don't find anything, and one should, one should learn enough fiqh to be able to diagnose oneself. Or one should consult a faqih if they have a question. Consult the person of knowledge if they have a question about something. If they don't find anything, then they should have a good opinion of Allah. They shouldn't think that Allah is upset with them. They should have a good opinion of Allah SWT and, and hope that this is an elevation. Because the believer, the test of the believer is an elevation for the believer. And uh, one of the one of the litmus tests that it's actually in Imam Nahlawi cites Sidi Abdul Qadir al-Jailani, rahimahullah, in the same chapter. He says that uh, one of the ways to tell if your test is a punishment versus an elevation from Allah is to look at your state during the test. If your state during the test is objecting to Allah and feeling frustrated at Allah and complaining to others complaining to people that can't help you, not like a physician if you're sick, but just complaining to people that can't even advise you, just letting off steam or whatnot, then that's a sign that it could be a punishment from Allah SWT, that you're being lowered, your own state during the trial. But if your state during the trial is one of contentment with Allah's decree, one of holding on to sabr, holding on to patience, one of... Uh, of, of trusting Allah and having a good opinion, even if it hurts. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't experience pain. Experiencing pain does not contradict contentment. Contentment is to object to Allah and to be frustrated, but experiencing pain is human. So besides the pain, as long as one is content and not frustrated and objecting at Allah, then it's a sign, sign inshallah, that they're being elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to trust Allah and to have a good opinion of Him. And that's the second question as well. What advice can you give someone who suffers from sadness or depression vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with Allah? I think it's the same answer. It's a test from Allah. So be content with Allah's testing you with it. Don't object or don't be frustrated at Allah for this test. And then inshallah, it's an elevation. And, and uh, Allah gives, uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala tries people that He loves with anxieties and and states of sadness. This is something that happens. One of the masters, Abu Bakr al-Shibli said, He says that Allah's raising His servants is commensurate to their anxiety. Allah's raising of servants is commensurate to their anxiety. Sometimes anxiety, it's a test from Allah and it's a way that Allah elevates people that are close to Him. If you find a lot of anxiety, don't don't stress about the stress. Just give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, seek the means to lessen it. We're not negating. Always seek the means to lessen it, whether medical, whether psychological, whether social, whatever means. That's from the sunnah to, to rectify one's state. But uh, don't despair about the very test of anxiety or depression because it's, it's, it's an elevation, inshallah. 
as long as we're not consistently in haram things, we should make sure that we're, we've diagnosed ourselves, inshallah. So, any other questions? Bismillah. Um, at the beginning of the discussion, you mentioned that the Muslims and believers should not be happy with themselves, and they should have a habit of checking themselves. And you did mention that not being happy with yourself can be a good thing. But how would you differentiate that from the nafs al nafs al Okay, so the question about not being pleased with the way one is that we started the discussion with vis-a-vis -vis differentiating the types of nafs, the nafs al lawama the blaming nafs, nafs al amara bisud, the nafs that always commands to evil, um, the nafs al mutmainna the nafs that is at, at peace with Allah. Uh, so... Muhammad. That's a good question. Um, my very elementary understanding is that uh, even the people who have the nafs mutma'inna, who are contented with Allah because they have a proximity to Allah, they're still not pleased with themselves. If they if they look at themselves, they still say that there there's no good in themselves, and they need to improve. They're always looking to improve. They're always seeking the Prophet ﷺ himself sought Allah's forgiveness 70 or 100 times a day. And there's no, there's no improvement with the Prophet. He's, impec he's impeccable and infallible, sallallahu Yet Allah is raising him in degree at every moment. And so at every moment, as he's raised to a new degree, Ghazali's explanation of that hadith, as the Prophet, sallallahu is raised to a new degree in every moment, if he considers the prior moment and the degree he was at, he feels a sense of, shame in front of Allah that he makes istighfar for because he was a lower state, a lower station or degree. But his rank, is, because his rank is perpetually increasing, uh, but it doesn't mean he does anything wrong, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so, uh, so the people of Allah uh, who are not prophets, who are fallible, that they, however close they are to Allah, they, they, they see room for improvement. And, uh, and and they are they are, and then also the whatever good they see, they see it as wama bikum min ni'matin So whatever whatever blessing you have is from Allah. So they don't attribute it to themselves. So you know there is different stages of this journey, uh, but I think for most people uh, there is always room for improvement. You know Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah. That's a good question, though. Anything else? Is there a good comment, like in the ayat of the Jafar, so what, what would it mean there? Is there good covetousness? No, the, yeah, the, the positive tama that's mentioned in the Quran is different from what we're talking about. And the positive tama is ho, raja. It's used for raja, hope in Allah. So the po, po, positive Covet, quote unquote, it's not covetousness, but the the positive, it's it's hope. Tamak can be used for hope as well. Hope in Allah, Raja. And Raja is to have a good opinion of Allah while taking the means of serving Allah. It's always coupled with the means. So the in the ayah that was cited, they're doing that worship out of hope. It's not that they're not worshiping, but having hope. So to have Raja, you know, Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah. Anything else? I have a yeah. You have talked about the taqweed and tawakkul, that both of them are the same, and how different are they? Uh, tafweed and tawakkul, many ulama consider them uh, sort of the same thing, intertwined. So tawakkul is to rely on Allah, tafweed is to consign your affair to Allah. Some of them, there, there's some discussion, like I think Imam Biqai one of the great mufassirs of our tradition, he said that tawakkul stems from tafweed. So, so that tafweed is the foundation of giving the affair to Allah. Tawakkul then is to rely that Allah will take care of that affair appropriately or for the best for one, one's uh, affairs. So they're, they're 
they're they're intertwined. Uh, you know, any other no, see. When you mentioned the fourth and the fifth one, the, the being afraid of being blamed and the love for praise, you mentioned the hadith and mu'min and al-Qur'an and mu'min. Forgive me, see, I lost the connection between that hadith and what you Oh, sure. So the, the, when we talked about blame, fear of blame or criticism uh, vis-a-vis uh, the hadith, Al-Mu'min Mir'atul Mu'min, the believer is the mirror of the believer. Meaning that when when my fellow believer criticizes me, the hadith is saying that that person is my mirror. So just like with the physical, you go to the mirror, you go to the mirror for a reason. You want to make sure there's no defect. Your buttons aren't lopsided. The topi isn't. If you were a dopey, it's not. <laughs> you want to fix up, fix yourself up because you want to be presentable. So, so too spiritually, when you're with the believer, it's a chance to fix yourself up so you're presentable to Allah. And they say, hey, by the way, I noticed you did this or you need to work on this. And, and so you can make yourself, that's like the dopey being lopsided. Your heart has, you can fix things and then, and then you're presentable to your Lord. So it's, it's, it's actually, so how do we see the mirror? Are we upset at the mirror? It's like, how dare you? <laughs> Never show my topis lopsided again. <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> no, it's like, oh, alhamdulillah, thank God for the mirror. I can fix myself up, right? The buttons are all. <laughs> so it's like, thank God for the criticism. I can fix myself up. So in the end, it's just nafs. It's just the problem is the nafs. In the end, do we want one principle to s- summarize everything that was said? The bottom line problem is the ego. <laughs> and the ego is a really, really nasty. Allah, you know, Allah, you know, may Allah forgive the ego for all of its, uh, you know, the Prophet said, وسلم, in an authentic hadith, Al Mujahid man jahad nafsahu lillahi azza wa jal. Al Mujahid man jahad nafsahu lillahi azza wa jal. The hadith about the we return from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, that's a weak hadith. So it's cited a lot, but the isnad is weak. But this hadith is strong. It's an authentic hadith. That uh, I think in Ibn Hibban, Sahih Ibn Hibban, that the, that the true struggler for Allah, the mujahid, the true manjahid al nafsa, the one that struggles against, combats his very ego, lillahi azza wa for the sake of God, mighty and majestic. For the sake of God, mighty and majestic. And so uh, that's the bottom line principle. Just try to sublimate the nafs a little and appreciate whatever Allah is doing to us, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. I mean, any other questions, concerns, criticisms? I guess I should be open to your criticism. So. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. JazakAllah khair. May Allah protect us, forgive us, grant us tawfiq with all of these meanings and uh, rectify the state of the Ummah, the blessed Ummah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Grant us to tawfiq to be a part of that rectification and revival and, uh, and recognition of what's sacred and holy and to make us people that are pleasing to our Lord. Uh, despite our shortcomings. Wa salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi Lumi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi Lumi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Tisliman kathira. So, leaving off or resuming where we left off, Imam al Nahlawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, we're on the 12th uh, vice or sin of the heart. And we mentioned that we skipped over a few because those discussions would be lengthy. But the twelfth one is al-kibr, al-kibr, which is arrogance. It's with the sukun in the middle, kibr. If you say kibar with the fatha, it means to be larger than, right? Physically larger. So that's a different word. But kibr with the sukun is arrogance. And uh, he follows this one with... uh, uh, a couple sins later, he mentions al-ujub. The 14th is al-ujub. So, al-ujub can be translated as narcissism. Narcissism, al-kibr, arrogance. What's the difference? Al-ujub is merely internal. It's, it's irrespective of other people. When one thinks that, special, that themselves as special, 
when one thinks thinks excuse me thinks of himself or herself as uh, deserving merit, whereas al kibr <coughs> is externally oriented. It's vis-a-vis -vis another person, or vis-a-vis -vis the truth. And so we'll discuss that. Uh, and so kibr is a manifestation of ujub. Kibr is when ujub manifests externally. If it remains internal, it's ujub. So al kibr he defines it. He says. وَهُوَ الْإِسْتِرْوَاحُ وَالْرُكُونُ إِلَىٰ رُؤْيَةِ النَّفْسِ فَوْقَ الْمُتَكَبَّرْ عَلَيْهِ فَلَا بُدَّ مِنْهُ بِخِلَافِ الْعُجُبِ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَىٰ مَنْ يَعْجُبْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يُسَمَّى عُجْبًا He says, Kibr, arrogance, is to find satisfaction. Istirwah is to find raha. You find comfort. You find satisfaction. You find a type of repose. وَالرُّكُونِ إِلَىٰ And also you are, uh, you rely on, so it's to find comfort, solace, and to rely on رُؤِيَةِ النَّفْسِ فَوْقَ الْمُتَكَبْرِ عَلَيْهِ Seeing yourself as superior to the one that you're arrogant towards. So it is to be comfortable with, to find solace in, and to rely on the notion of seeing yourself as superior than someone else. This is Kibr. And so he, he makes this, the distinction between Ujib. He says, so therefore, for Kibr to take effect, there must be another person that you see yourself superior to, as opposed to Ujib narcissism, because a person alone can be narciss narcissistic. It doesn't need uh, uh, a fellow person. He says, well, Kibru haram. Kibr is unlawful. Okay? Kibr is unlawful. It is a sinful disease of the heart. It's not merely blameworthy. Last week we mentioned a few that were blameworthy, like tama, for example, coveting something of the dunya. We said as long as that thing that you're coveting is not haram, then the tama is not haram. It's, a, it's very blameworthy. It's a type of disease, but it's not sinful in and of itself. Kibr in and of itself is haram. So there's actually sin incurred when a person sees himself as better than another and has these emotional component, these psychological components, which are istirwah and rukun, to find solace in it and to rely on it. He says it's a radila alima min al-ibad. It's really a, a horrific enormity. It's a disgusting enormity of servants. Wahua sunnah to iblis al -lain. It is the sunnah of the cur accursed devil. Okay, so this word sunnah, we use it normally for our Prophet وسلم, which is the sunnah that we aim to emulate. But every Every character has their sunnah. Every person or agent or entity has their sunnah, the way a person is. And so Iblis, his sunnah is what? It's kibr. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to prostrate to Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, right, amongst the angels, he says no, he refuses to. Abba was takbar. Ha. He refuses was takbar and he has kibr. Allah ta'ala describes was takbar. He has kibr. He's arrogant. And what does he say? He says, Ana khayrun min. And here is now the definition. So he's finding solace and he's relying on seeing himself as superior to another. Ana khayrun minhu, I'm better than him. Khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahu min teen. You created me from fire, you created him from clay. Which also shows that Iblis responds with logic. <laughs> Iblis responds with logic. It's faulty logic, but he attempts, it's a syllogism, right? I made a fire. He's made of clay. Fire innately is better than clay, therefore I am better than him. It's a syllogism, which is why when Allah's hukum comes, we make sajda, we put the head down on the ground. We don't try to rationalize with Allah's hukum, but we submit. And literally, he was supposed to put his head on the ground. He was supposed to make sajda. He was supposed to submit to that hukum. But he tried to rationalize his way out, which is why our tradition, without going too much into, the t into a tangent, the way of Ahl Sunnah is revelation first and then reason. Revelation first and then reason. So revelation comes, the Prophet comes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the people around him seek him. They seek suhba, they, they gravitate towards him to receive revelation, revelation. And then as they go through life, as they teach, as the next generation takes from them, receives revelation from them, uh, needs emerge in the community that require reason. So explaining the meanings, 
uh, assuring the community there's no contradictions in our theology, responding to criticisms, whether of other theologians or converts from other traditions who come with their intellectual uh, baggage or luggage, however you look at it. So then reason is deployed to preserve and, and, and undergird or, or support revelation, to justify, if you will, in the minds of people, revelation. But it does not start with reason, in the sense that the Sahaba did not hear the Qur'an, learn it, and then go off in the world as philosophers to simply reason their way and, and, and make analogies on their own. It's not reason first and then revelation, it's revelation first and then reason. And this is the unique paradigm of Ahl Sunnah. If you look at all the different sects of Islam, who are still Muslim, but they are uh, they are outside of the Sunni paradigm. Most, if not all, put reason first. They put reason first and they departed from these chains of narration, which is preservation of revelation. The isnad is ultimately a connection to revelation first. The, the, in in Islam, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, in the uh, physical worship, the intellectual understandings, and the experiential element of the religion, Re uh, revelation first through suhba, chains of narration to the Prophet Sallallahu but then in the different circumstances the community finds itself in, reason is deployed for its use. So Iblis rationalized before receiving revelation. So this is the way of Iblis, kibr. Women ashril akhlaq al and this is of the worst of blameworthy traits. وَصَاحِبُهُ مُنَازِعٌ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي كِبْرِيَائِهِ وَعَظَمَتِهِ Okay, wh why is this so disgusting? One of the main reasons why kibr, arrogance, is so disgusting is because such a person is competing with God. Such a person is competing with Allah Ta'ala in Allah's kibriya. So Allah has kibriya. The human, when they, when they are arrogant, they, they have kibr. But when, you, when a person has kibr, then they're trying to co-share in Allah's kibriya. Kibriya is Allah's, uh, you know, un, unending majesty. His supreme majesty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. His supreme glory, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah can say, ana khayrun min. Allah can say, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. Allah is better. Allah is superior. One of the names of Allah is al-mutakabbir. Al-mutakabbir. When this word is used for human beings, it's a disease. When it's used for Allah, it's a praiseworthy name, one of the beautiful names of Allah, because He has the right to say, I am better than my creation, for He is indeed better than His creation. So when a person tries to have, uh, when, they, when, they, when they're arrogant towards other, others, then they, it's as if they're competing with God in His kibriya wa adama, in His glory and majesty. And then he goes into terminology, he says, if this is manifested in behavior, it's called takabur. If this is manifested in behavior, it's called takabur. The way you talk to someone, the way you uh, deal with someone, that's called takabur. If it stays internal, it's simply that internal solace of feeling superior, then it's kibr. Mm -hmm. Then it's kibr. Which is why takabur can be seen in the world. You can see takabur in the world when one person is arrogant towards another. Okay, whereas kibr in and of itself is in the heart of a person, and both are haram. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, how, to, how to deal with the mutakabir a little bit. Ibn Mas'ud relates, Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is in, uh, one of the most central hadith uh, that has both ethics and metaphysics in it. Mus Muslim relates this, it's Sahih hadith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, A person who in his heart is an Adam's weight of arrogance shall not enter paradise. This is very frightening. Someone who has a, a, an Adam's weight, Mithqalu Dharra, you know, the dharra is the smallest particle, so the string or the electron, whatever is the smallest. Uh, that much of kibr in their heart, la yadkhulul jannah, shall not enter paradise. Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, when he comments, Nawawi, not Nahlawi, Nawawi, when he comments on this hadith, he says that, of course, in our aqidah, every Muslim 
eventually goes to paradise. So, how do we understand the statement that the Prophet says, لا يدخل الجنة shall not enter paradise a person that has an Adam's weight of kibr in their heart. That Nawawi says, Rahimullah, that uh, with respect to a Muslim that has kibr, it could mean that they will not be amongst the first wave of Muslims that enter paradise, i.e. there's a great delay in their time. Or there is a temporary punishment that they have to go through in the hell before being taken out. We ask Allah to protect us from that. So the hadith continues, فَقَالَ رَجُلْ A man asked, إِنَّ الرَّجُلْ يُحِبُّ أَنْ يَكُنْ ثَوْبُهُ حَسَنًا وَنَعْلُهُ حَسَنًا He says, uh, uh, oh, oh Allah's Messenger, a person loves that his garments and his sandals look beautiful. A person loves for his garments and sandals to be beautiful. And uh, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَمِيلٌ يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ الْكِبْرُ بَطْرُ الْحَقُّ وَغَمْتُ النَّاسِ so the Prophet responds, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. So our desire to look nice, to be presentable in the way we dress, in the way we carry ourselves, this is not arrogance. And he, so how does the Prophet explain it? Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. This is adorning yourself with something that reflects a divine attribute. Rather, what is kibr, what is arrogance? بَطْرُ الْحَقْ وَغَمْطُ النَّاسِ It's obstinacy to the truth and demeaning other people. بَطْرُ الْحَقْ Obstinacy, rejection, uh, arrogant rejection of truth and look, looking down and belittling fellow man. So there's two ways kibr manifests. We said it has to be vis-a-vis -vis another. The other can either be truth or a person. It's not only towards people. Belittling a person, that's kibr. But when truth is presented to a person, and when it's made clear and shown that it's true, then how does the heart respond? If it, if it rejects it out of a, state of a haughtiness, if it doesn't submit to truth, that's kibr, towards the truth now. So, بَطْرُ الْحَقْ وَغَمْتُ النَّاسِ Or belittling fellow, fellow man. This is the hadith. And what's the ethics is obvious of being humble. The metaphysics is from the statement, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Verily, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. In the sense that all of beauty in the world, every time we see beauty, we, every time we recognize beauty, we are in reality recognizing something of Allah. Every time we see beauty, we are in reality recognizing something of the divine beauty. It's mirroring an attribute of God. And if you notice, Beauty is one of the three reasons why people fall in love, right? The three reasons that people fall in love, the ulama say, Jamal, Kamal, and Ihsan. There's three reasons why people fall in love. Jamal, when they see beauty. Kamal, when they see perfection or mastery. And Ihsan, when people are good to them. When people act beautifully towards them. Ihsan, also from the root husn, which is beauty. It all goes back to beauty. So in the world, when we see Jamal, when we see beauty, and we are, are the heart, it, there's, there's a, something that happens to the heart, that, something that happens to the soul that's inexplicable. It's inexplicable. What is it that touches the soul, right? It's Allah touching the soul. When the heart sees Kamal, perfection, any perfection, you see a master pianist, a master musician, a master... Uh, uh, sports uh, athlete, a master, uh, anytime we, we perceive Kamal in the world, it's reflecting Allah's Kamal. Allah is the one giving the ability to, to reach mastery. And it touches the soul in a way that mundane things don't touch the soul. What's touching the soul? Something of Allah's perfection. When we see uh, Ihsan, anytime people around us are good to us, the goodwill and love that we experience, the generosity that we experience from our families, from our friends, from our communities, from the stranger that smiles. All of these, the big and the little, the great and the small, these are reflecting Allah's ihsan. It's really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala working through his, with, through his creation or with His creation. People are simply asbab, they're simply means. Allah is the ultimate agent. And so we are experiencing the divine ihsan, the divine uh, 
uh, excellent uh, action or beautiful action. So, so our love, when it's directed towards creation, we don't realize we're actually loving Allah. When we're loving something in creation, in reality, we're loving something of Allah's action that's touching us or something of Allah's attribute that's touching us. And so the people of Allah, they realize this. Everyone, when they love, they're loving something of Allah. Allah is the one creating the situation that makes us fall in love with whatever it is. But the people of Allah recognize, they, they realize that it's Allah doing it. The people who are distant from Allah, they're, they're heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, kibr then, this is, this is the great crime in Islam. Wasabubul kibr, the basis of kibr, fil haqita, in reality, the ultimate root of kibr, al jahl, is ignorance. Is ignorance. It's not realizing that uh, your fellow man and yourself are both creations of Allah. And so there's no basis of you feeling superior than the other. Whatever gifts you have that make you think you're superior are gifts from Allah. He, and, he, and as He created it the first place, He can simply take it away. So if you're arrogant towards someone because of your good looks, how handsome you are, uh, Allah is the one making you good looking and Allah, God forbid, could take it away. If you're arrogant because of your wealth, just look at the 2008 financial crisis and how quickly multi-millionaires and billionaires can, can fall to, to you know, petty change. Uh, wealth is, is fanny, it's going away, uh, it's, 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 it's always perishing. And so Allah could take that away, God forbid. If, you're, if the reason is you feel special is because of your intelligence, God forbid, Allah could take that away. Allah is the one giving you that tawfiq. And it doesn't have to be something dramatic. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put the intelligent person in a context where they make a fool of themselves and they realize, man, I'm, I'm, not, the, I'm not as uh, intelligent as I thought I was. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the muwaffiq. Whatever character trait in yourself that you are enamored by, that makes you feel superior, you're enamored by tawfiq of Allah. You're enamored by Allah's enabling grace, Allah's creative fiat. He is making you great. And so see the action of Allah before you see uh, the whatever uh, of yourself that you're impressed with. فَعِلَاجُهُ So its cure, its treatment, izalatu sababihi is to remove the cause. So to treat the, er the ignorance that underlies it. Naam. So, and then he mentions that takabbur, which we said is when you manifest behavior of, of, of belittling someone else or acting, acting arrogantly, acting haughty, haughtily, haughtiness. Takabur hatiness was when you, when it manifests in behavior. He says, "What takabur haram?" Uh, take this next sentence with a big grain of salt, but I'll just mention it. What takabur haram? Takabur is unlawful. Illa ala al mutakabur, except towards someone who is also haughty. فَإِنُهُ قَدْ وَرَدَ فِيهِ أَنَّهُ صَدَقَ Because it is come in some narrations that that's a type of charity. So what is he saying? He's saying that if there is someone who's very arrogant and he's manifesting that, sometimes in certain contexts, if, if a person puts them in their place a little bit, they act a little arrogant towards them, just to help them be subdued a bit, then it's not haram in those, in those contexts. As long as your intention is sound, and, uh, and it doesn't lead to more fitna, which is why it's take it with a grain of salt, because it's very difficult to navigate these, these uh, situations without causing more problems. But there's certain contexts where, um, where uh, if a person does that, uh, you know, sometimes like a, 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 a teacher, for example, with a student, the student is acting arrogant towards fellow, fellow students. So the teacher in the context can act a little bit towards him put them back in their place, that is not haram. There's, so what he's saying is that there's certain contexts, as long as it won't lead to more fitna, and basically it's for the sake of protecting someone from harming themselves with this sin, 
to humble them a bit, uh, that's a type of sadaqah. That's a type of uh, charity. And, uh, you know, but, but don't get into, into the habit of that because, <laughs> like we said, it's a slippery slope. No. I think when you're navigating things in the world, when you come upon that, <clears throat> if someone's really arrogant towards the situation, if you can't get your, you can't take care of business. So if you're trying to take care of business for the sake of God and somebody's been too arrogant, you have to be, you have to be strong back. Otherwise yeah. Otherwise you won't gain any ground. Yeah, exactly. You know, even for the sake of God, you can't even handle your business. Absolutely. You can't even get a word in. Yeah. Yeah. So there's certain contexts where th this is appropriate, where you have to sort of stand up, be strong, maybe put others in their place, not out of a real sense of arrogance, but for, for an ultimate benefit uh, or to ward off a, a, a worse harm, right? And, and so this comes with hikmah. This is where hikmah comes in, which is really a gift from Allah, that, that a people of wisdom, they know how to deploy these things for the sake of God uh, in their appropriate contexts. And, you know, we ask Allah for, for hikmah. So, um, naam. And I uh, want to read a little bit from the Ihyanu uh, Medin. So back to the default. So that's the exceptional situation. But back to the default, which is to, and even in, the, in that exceptional case, the heart still is still humbled before Allah. You see, the person is doing it for the sake of Allah to mitigate a situation, but they're not genuinely arrogant internally. They're not genuinely, they don't believe that they're superior to that person, that they're doing it because they realize Allah is the one testing him with that kibr and if if they don't have kibr in their heart Allah is the one safeguarding them so they they realize they see Allah's act uh, in these manifestations but so always even in those exceptional cases the heart has the opposite of kibr which is tawadu the heart has the opposite of kibr which is what tawadu tawadu is to be lower is to see yourself as lower than fellow man Tawadur is it's translated as humility, meaning what? To see yourself as lower than fellow man. Okay? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma tawada ahadun lillah illa rafa'ahu Allah. You know, these are golden or far more valuable than gold. Yeah. Spiritual gold. And the, these are these are these are you can empirically test these. The Prophet is saying, no one lowered himself, again, vis-a-vis -vis fellow man. No one lowered himself. No one was humble vis-a-vis -vis fellow man for the sake of God, except that God elevated him. Except that God elevated him. Now, um, uh, That it connects with giving preference to others, too. Giving preference. Because, you know, they're similar. When, you, when you're humble, if you see somebody wants something that you're using or something, you can say, oh, you take that first. You know, if there's one bed, you have the bed. So it's a form of giving preference to others, which is chivalry. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, futuwa, chivalry, and ithar, preferring others, it's based off of tawadu. You can't prefer someone else unless you are. You genuinely elevate them in your mind compared to yourself. So the Prophet is teaching us no one ever lowers himself except that Allah elevates him. No one ever lowers himself for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates him. And Imam Juraidi, the student of Imam Junaid. Imam Juraidi was the one, when Imam Junaid passed away, he took the kursi, like he took his position in Baghdad as the spiritual mentor of, of their students. Uh, and he, Imam Juraidi, rahimahullah, uh, there was a, a, a musibah, a calamity that affected the town. And uh, when when they went in afterwards, and many, many people had died from this calamity, they found him, the, uh, his, some months later, they found his body still intact, and he was in this position with the finger up. He had died in that state. During, while the fitna was unfolding, he died in the state with Tawheed, and Allah preserved his body for several months as a sign for people. This is Imam Juraidi, amazing master, rahimahullah. Imam Juraidi, he made a statement that reflects this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Man radiya biduni qadrihi, rafa'ahullahu fawqa ghayatihi. It's a beautiful statement. Juraidi says, whoever is content 
with being less than his real value, whoever is content with being seen by others as less than his real value, Allah will elevate him beyond his limit. Allah will elevate him beyond his limit. فَوْقَ غَايَتِهِ And you might have a certain genuine value that's, that's true. You know, you might have certain qualifications, you might have certain background, you might have certain talents, and those are genuine th- gifts from Allah that you recognize. And maybe other people don't recognize that. And that's a test of tawadu. Are you going to be humble or are you going to feel arrogant in responding to that lack of recognition? And Imam Jurayi says, whoever is content, fully content with, with that, with being seen as less than their true value, Allah will elevate them beyond their limit. Whatever limit you could imagine for yourself, that, you know, that's, I couldn't imagine getting more than that, getting higher than that in whatever arena or field I would like to do or, or pursue, Allah will give more. So these are, these are spiritual secrets that our masters mentioned. Uh, our mother Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, she would tell her students, and she was a teacher of scholars. Our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, Aisha radiallahu anha, was a teacher of scholars. She would tell her students, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَغْفُلُونَ عَنْ أَفْضَلِ الْعِبَادَاتِ التَّوَادُعِ إِنَّكُمْ لَتَغْفُلُونَ عَنْ أَفْضَلِ الْعِبَادَاتِ التَّوَادُعِ She would say to them, Verily, you all are completely oblivious of the best form of worship. Tawadu' You all are oblivious, you're heedless, you're not paying attention to the very best form of worship, which is tawadu, to humble yourself vis-a-vis fellow man. Yusuf ibn Asbat, one of the great of the Salaf, he says, Yajzi qalilu tawadu min kathir al-ijtihad. And this is particularly apt in our latter days with our lazy ways. <laughs> he says, he says that just a little bit of humility will suffice a whole lot of spiritual exertion. Mm-hmm. You know, to get to very high ranks with Allah, people have to put in a lot of ijtihad, a lot of spiritual exertion, of, 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 of pushing oneself in spiritual rigors and spiritual devotions. You can bypass all of that with just a little bit of tawadu, just a little bit of humility, and you'll reach the, re- the, the ranks of people of much spiritual works. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he's reported to have said uh, that Allah Ta'ala revealed to him, Allah Ta'ala, it's reported that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, إِذَا أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكَ بِنِعْمَةٍ فَاسْتَقْبِلْهَا بِالْإِسْتِكَانَ وَتَمِّمْهَا عَلَيْكَ When I bless you with a blessing, when I grant you a blessing, then receive it with uh, humble humbleness. Istikana, it's similar to tawadu, but it's literally to be broken. Istikana is when you're broken and, 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 and subdued by Allah's gift. Istikana. He says, uh, the, the, the narration says, Allah told Prophet Jesus salam, when I give you a blessing, then receive it with a state of istikana, with humbled brokenness in front of Allah's gift, if you do that, I will fulfill that blessing. I will complete that blessing for you. Malik ibn Dinar, the great Tabi'i Imam, Malik ibn Dinar, he used to teach at the, in, the, in the masjid, his students, and he said once, <clears throat> if a man outside the masjid door made an announcement, let the worst of you come out. Let the worst of you come out. He said, no one would beat me to the, to the door except someone physically stronger or faster. Malik ibn Dinar. He said, if someone outside said, let the worst of you come out, no one, no one would beat me to the, to the door except someone physically stronger or physically faster. When Abdullah ibn Mubarak, the other great master of their generation, heard that Malik ibn Dinar said that, he says that's why he became a Malik. His name Malik is master. He says because of that he became a master. He, beca- he realized his name. Musa ibn Qasim says, 
كانت عندنا زلزلة وريح حمراء فذهبت إلى محمد بن مقاتل فقلت يا أبا عبد الله أنت إمامنا فادعو الله عز وجل لنا So again sees these masters of the early Salaf Musa bin Qasim said, relates that in their town there was once a violent earthquake and uh, earthquake and violent winds earthquake and violent winds natural disaster so he rushed to Muhammad bin Muqatil uh, another imam at the time and he says ya abu abdullah o father of abdullah you're our imam you're our our sheikh so make dua for us to allah fabaka so Muhammad bin Muqatil starts weeping and he says, لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَكُنْ سَبَبَ هَلَاكِكُمْ He said, that if only I weren't the very reason why Allah is sending this calamity. I would make dua, but if only I weren't the very reason that Allah is sending this calamity. قَالْ The man who went to him, Musa bin Qasim, he says, فَرَأَيْتُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فِي النَّوْمِ That night I saw the Prophet in a dream, صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَقَالْ And the Prophet says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Verily, Allah has removed this tribulation from you now because of the dua of Muhammad ibn Muqatil. Like, why was he a person that his dua was immediately accepted? And to such an extent that the Prophet gives the good news to his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa in the dream, because he literally saw himself as the very reason that Allah's punishment was coming. So this is the humility of the early masters. And we'll mention one last statement from the Ihya that Abu Sulaiman al Darani, another early master, fourth century, I believe, of Syria. Abu Sulaiman al Darani, Rahimullah, says, لو اجتمع الخلق على أن يدعوني كاتضاعي عند نفسي ما قدروا عليه. لو اجتمع الخلق على أن يدعوني كت and this is the sublime levels these people were, had reached internally. This is internal worship that they had. He says, if all of creation gathered to humble and lower me, the way I have, to the extent that I've already lowered myself internally, they would prove incapable of that. If the entire creation joined forces to make me humbled, to subdue my ego, the way I've already done so, they wouldn't be able to. All right, these are the people that, uh, alhamdulillah. So Imam Nahlawi, rahimahullah, he gives some, uh, some symptoms to look out for if we have arrogance. He has some symptoms to look out for. He says that arrogance is often hidden from the one that has it. So he thinks that he's without arrogance. So it's necessary to present some of the characteristics of the arrogant so that everyone can inspect himself in comparison, whereby the despicable is distinguished from the wholesome. Amongst the signs of arrogance are the following, that a person like for people to stand for him or in front of him out of respect. If you like for people to stand for you or in front of you out of respect. That you, that one, that one does not walk except with someone behind him. If you prefer that others walk behind you. That if you avoid visiting others out of pride. If you avoid vi visiting others out of pride. To dislike for others to sit close to him. For one to dislike that others sit close to him. That one avoid keeping the company of people with illness or defects out of haughtiness and pride. To avoid keeping the company of people with illness or defects out of haughtiness and pride. The same applies to avoiding, excuse me, avoiding the company of the poor. This is a big one. To avoid the company of people who have uh, in, in material poverty. Uh, this is a big sign of kibr, of arrogance. And on this note, Sulaiman the great prophet, Solomon, peace be upon him, who was of the wealthiest ever, he would, when he would leave his home every morning, 
uh, he would l examine the faces of the people sitting. They used to sit in circles outside of his house, and he would look at their faces. And when he could, as he was walking, he could tell how, if people were wealthy or not. And so, whenever he saw the wealthy, he would pass by them. He would keep on walking until he found the poor, and he would sit amongst them. He would survey people and keep on walking until he found the poor. And when he would sit with the poor, he would, he would put his head down and he would say, Miskin ma'al masakin. He would say, a poor man amongst poor men. A poor man amongst poor men. So this is the way of prophets, is to love the poor, to be, want to be around the poor. And the Prophet ﷺ himself, would, he advised Abu Dhar al-Ghifari and others with wasiya, with specific counsel, to, 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 uh, to love the poor, hubb al-masakin, wa dunu ma'ahum, or dunu alayhim, and to actually be proxi have proximity with them, to have proximity with the poor. This is something, uh, a great sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ. Another sign is that one dislike to respond to the invitation of the poor, yet responds to the invitation of the wealthy and sophisticated, right? When you're invited by upper class people, quote unquote, you happily attend. If you're invited by lower class people, quote unquote, you're hesitant. That one does not undertake domestic chores with his own hands. <laughs> yeah, Latif. So the domestic chores of the house, right, to not do that is a, is a sign of, of, of kibr. So one should be a part of the team at home to, to take care of the chores. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And this is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hadith says, our mother Aisha described, kana fi mihnati ahlihi. In the authentic hadith, kana fi mihnati ahlihi. He was always in the service of his family. He was always in the service of his family. What's interesting about this hadith and Allah knows best, if you actually look at the other narrations in the Shama'il about the prophetic chores in the home, what the Prophet would do, وسلم, it was his own chores. He would mend, they would describe in other hadith, he would mend his own clothes, he would mend his own shoes, he would, you know, fasten his own, whatever, thing, his own personal objects, the chores relating to his own things at home, he would do those, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's interesting, if this could be the interpretation of that hadith, he was always in the service of his family, in the sense that if the husband can at least do his own work, <laughs> he's serving the family. <laughs> My wife tells me that all the time. Just take care of your stuff and you're, you've served us. <laughs> My books pile up. and. My books, they tend to take over the house. Right? They have like the, a life of their own, so I have to contain them. And <laughs> Alhamdulillah. That one does not carry his own groceries home from the store. That one does not carry, and obviously, you know, one should try to serve the chores of others in the home too. We're not denying that, but it's it's, you know, it's a big thing for a lot of men especially, to do their own home, work in home. And if they can do that, that is a service uh, uh, for the family. But the more the better. <clears throat> that, one, uh, not under, uh, that one not carry his own groceries home from, from the store. That one does not carry their own groceries home, home from the store. That one dislike to fulfill the needs of his relatives or friends, especially buying, bu excuse me, especially buying inexpensive things. That one dislikes to fulfill the needs of his relatives or, or friends, especially with buying inexpensive things. And so to always be magnanimous in your persona, in your comportment, in your uh, behavior. Uh, that one find it hard for his colleagues to walk ahead of him or sit in front of him. Uh, so, so, and you know, Imam Al Ghazali talks about with kibr and hasad, with arrogance and envy. These 
manifest most commonly with one's colleagues. You know, so the, the butcher, the local butcher, he normally doesn't get jealous with the local shoemaker or the local, but the fellow butchers who are competing, right, that's where these diseases manifest more. It's with the same, uh, uh, the same, uh, you know, when colleagues of, of a profession or, or a endeavor. And so one should be, be very vigilant when around one's colleagues to see the state uh, of their heart. And so he gives a, 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 a very simple example that you don't want them to walk ahead of you or to sit in front of you, but extend that to our circumstances now. So basically to not want them to have a superior position in the eyes of others relative to yourself. And then probably, uh, 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 possibly most important, the last sign he gives, that one does not accept the truth when debating one's colleagues, uh, nor, does, nor admitting to one's mistake, nor showing gratitude for being shown one's mistake, nor reflecting on what the other is saying during the debate, all out of contempt for the other person or out of obstinacy and seeking to outdo him. This is huge. Okay, I'll repeat it. A major sign of kibir that one does not accept the truth when debating one's colleagues. If you're, de if you're having a discussion or a debate, especially with colleagues, people that these diseases manifest a lot with, uh, if the truth is manifest, right, the hadith, what, how did the Prophet devi define kibir, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Batrul haq is to be obstinate to the truth. So it doesn't matter who the truth comes from, whether your, your, your competitor at work, whether a child, a seven-year-old, if the truth comes from them, whether uh, an ignorant person, uneducated, illiterate, someone without a college education, the truth comes from, no matter who it comes from, the truth is the truth. And so when it manifests, to humble yourself, otherwise it's kibr. So he says, when not accepting the truth when debating one's colleagues, not, nor admitting to one's mistake. So when you make a mistake or your reasoning is incorrect, to be slow or hesitant to admit that you made a mistake, this is out of kibber, this is out of arrogance. The person of humility, it's not about me. So you're right, you know, I made a mistake. This was an error on my part. Nor showing gratitude for being shown one's mistake. So some people, you know, yeah, I'll humble, I'll, 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 I'll accept the truth in a debate. And I'll even admit to my mistake. But I'll feel a type of agitation or annoyance at the person who pointed out my mistake there's still kibber in the person. The person without kibber, when they're shown their mistake, they actually respond with gratitude. Thank you for pointing out my mistake. <laughs> Sublime levels. Nor reflecting on what the other is saying during the debate. So you just want to one-up them rather than seek the truth. So in, in debates and these things, it should be about the truth. If the truth is paramount, then it's more of a mutual journey to discover what is right. Uh, a, a prophetic debate, a prophetic debate would be a mutual journey to discover what is right. It's not about me putting them down. Okay, so so long as it's about me putting the other down, it's it's there's doors for kibr. But if it's about a mutual journey, let's let's seek the truth together. And here's what I think, and here's why I think you're maybe mistaken. And, oh, okay, you brought this perspective. I didn't realize that. Thank you for that. You're helping me get to the goal of the truth, which is why Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, he said, I never debated someone except that I made dua that Allah manifest the truth on his tongue. Because it's not about Muhammad ibn Idris, a shafii it's about Allah. With Imam Shafi, it wasn't about him, it was about Allah. لِتَكُنْ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا No. The next device, which we won't spend too much time on, but it's worth just quickly mentioning. <clears throat> so we said kibr is arrogance to the truth or to fellow man. Its opposite is humility to uh, internally deem yourself as less than all others. Humility is to internally deem yourself as less than all others. Tawadur. Uh, when, in terms of behaving with others though, 
there's always a balance. So this has to be balanced with an opposite vice on the other end of the spectrum, which is tadallul, which is self-abasement. Self-abasement. So when you're humble with your fellow man or fellow believer, you do so uh, in a balanced way. If it's excessive in ter- as it's manifested, and we're making a distinction between the state of the heart and the behavior towards others. The state of the heart should be tadallul. The state of the heart should be very, very, like as low as one can go vis-a-vis the other. As we said, Abu Sulaiman al-Darani rahimallah, he said, if all people gathered to lower me the way I've already done so inside, they wouldn't be able to. So his internal state is at zero. But the way we interact with others should not be tadallul. We should not be, uh, uh, we should not abase ourselves in that as an expression of that. So we should be humble, have humility, but with the dignity of a believer, the dignity of a fellow brother. And that's the balance. And this is, so this is important. So that is blameworthy. It's not haram, but it's blameworthy. Okay, because al-mu'min la yudhillu nafsa, the Prophet said in the hadith, the believer does not uh, abase himself. And so based, uh, so there's the balance between we're never arrogant towards others, uh, we are moderate in, in our humility with, uh, with each other, balanced with the dignity of the believer, and we do not abase ourselves with other people. But internally, there is a deep self abasement, if, if you will. Uh, there are a few exceptions, though, that uh, in our tradition, uh, one exception is when you're seeking sacred knowledge. If someone is seeking knowledge of this religion, then there is a type of flattery one should have with one's teachers, with, with one's teachers and even with one's co-students. Even with one's co-students, uh, this would be this would not be blameworthy if one manifested a type of tadallul, where you completely lower yourself. Why? Because it allows for more benefit. The teacher clearly the 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 the, the you know the more one is uh, lower themselves when the more one lowers oneself vis-a-vis the teacher, that allows the opportunity to gain more of their wisdom and even fellow students because that type of benefit is there. But again, without being excessive without being excessive, okay? The next vice, 14, is ujub. Ujub, we said, is uh, narcissism. So again, narcissism was purely internal and it has nothing to do with other people. It's defined as istiadam al ni'ma wa rukun ilayha ma an nisyan idafatiha idafatiha ila al mun'im al haqiqi wa huwa Allah Ta'ala. Fa inna al ishtighal bin ni'mati an al mun'im ujbun madhmum. Narcissism ujb is to is, is for someone to deem his blessing as tremendous, to deem one's blessing as tremendous, and to rely on it while forgetting to attribute it to its giver, namely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, being preoccupied by a blessing from its giver is blameworthy narcissism. So, to be impressed with the gift and forget Allah. This is ujub. Ujub is to be impressed with the gift of Allah while forgetting the giver, Allah. So, your good looks, your athletic ability, your genius, your ability to write, your ability to dress, your ability to drive, your ability to drive others mad, whatever it is, (laughs) you're so impressed with that talent and you're not thinking of Allah at all. This is, this is ujub. That itself is ujub. So to, to notice your gifts, without noticing Allah, mm-hmm. is a blameworthy disease of the heart. Notice, it's very, it's very nuanced. To notice any gift 
without noticing Allah is a blameworthy disease of the heart. It's not haram, but it's blameworthy. We said kibir is haram. When that seed grows so much to where you think you're better than others, then it's haram. Even if you don't act on it, just thinking yourself as better than others is haram. Thinking yourself uh, internally not submitting to the truth is haram. Right? Mithqala dharra. Anyone that has even an Adam's weight of that won't enter paradise immediately. But narcissism is, is the seed of that, is just to notice your blessing without noticing Allah. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. Every time there's a blessing, he praises Allah. Look at all, just read like any of the book of du'as of the Prophet ﷺ, the book of Adhkar, Imam Nawawi, which is translated in English. Everyone should have a copy. The remembrances of Imam Nawawi. This should be, this should, uh, the believer should be connected with that book. And even if it's once every three months, learn a new du'a. We should always be increasing in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, we should always be learning a new du'a, like one really, really amazing, they're all amazing, a du'a that maybe we could learn together, that when the Prophet ﷺ would get a new garment, when the Prophet ﷺ would get a new garment, okay? Now here, a lot of us might get the new garment and not think of Allah and be like, oh, look at this that I have, and that's ujib. So look, look how the Prophet ﷺ, his very hal, his state, removes the ujib, by referring to Allah. What does he say when he gets the new garment? He says, first thing, Allahumma lak alhamd. Oh Allah, for you is praise. Ajeeb. Yeah, I mean, the most mundane thing we don't even think about, the Prophet is seeing it as a tajalli of Allah. Yeah, I mean, Allah is manifesting himself to me. Allahumma lak alhamd. Oh Allah, for you is all praise. Anta kasawtanihi. You donned me in it. You donned me in this garment. أَسْأَلُكَ خَيْرَهُ وَخَيْرَ مَا سُنِعْلَهُ I ask you for the good of it and the good of wh for which it was manufactured. Whoever made it, whatever good intention they have, I, I seek that. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّهِ وَشَرِّ مَا سُنِعْلَهُ And I seek refuge in you from, from its evil and whatever evil intention the manufacturer might have had when making it. Now especially in our time, when these brand names of God knows which corporations and what demonic actions they're doing and how they're disenfranchising the third world, quote unquote, so-called third world, uh, we should really make this dua, seeking refuge from the evil of whatever intention was behind. Like, we don't want any of that baggage. We, we just want to value the gift that Allah has given us. And so, Allahumma, you know, oh Allah, for you is praise. You donned me in this garment. I ask you if it's good and the good for which it was made. I seek refuge in you in the evil and the evil for which it was made. And one of the beautiful isharas that we learn from our teachers is that this is also a beautiful dua if Allah dons a new spiritual garment on you. So one of the things we were taught is that if Allah gives you the tawfiq to do, do a new good deed, that you hadn't been doing before, it's as if Allah gave you a new garment, a spiritual garment for your ruh. And so you should say this dua. With the, with the new tawfiq that you have, a new good deed that you weren't doing before, Allahumma lak alhamd. Oh Allah, for you alone is the praise. Anta kasawtanihi. You donned me in this good deed. You sent this good deed and draped me in it. I ask you for its good and the good for which it was created and I seek refuge from the evil and the evil for which it was created. So. Again, if you go through the adhkar of the Prophet ﷺ, you'll notice he's always seeking the giver whenever the gift is manifest. He's not rejecting gifts, but he wants the giver of the gift, Wasallam. This is the sunnah we should seek. So what's the opposite of ujub? The opposite of ujub is called dhikrul minna. Dhikrul minna is to remember the gift. It's to recollect Allah's favor. Dhikr al-minna. Allah is al-mannan, the one that gives the favor and has the right to pro proclaim, to remind of the favor. You know, man, this root man, in human beings it's haram. In human beings it's haram. It's like, you remember that time I did that for you? Come on, what's up? Remember the time I did that and the time I did that? This is called man. And Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, when you give sadaqah, don't follow it with man or adha. If you give charity, don't follow that charity up with reminding them of the charity or harming, the, hurting their feelings in that process. It's something that it's prohibited in the sacred law to do that. So we should mm -hmm. never remind someone of the... Why? Because Allah is al-mannan. He can give the gift and He can remind us, didn't I give that to you? 
Allah is al-mannan, the su su supreme reminder of his, of his gifts, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that gives favor and has the right to remind us. And so dhikrul minna is the cure for ujub, to recollect Allah's favor uh, with the gift. To recollect that, it's, that the gift only exists by the tawfiq of Allah. And because Allah has honored the person, and Allah has magnified the person with that gift. هذا الذكر فرد عند الدوائي العجب Imam Nahlawi says to do this, to recollect the favor of God is a religious obligation when one finds himself prone to those things that pull one into ujub عند الدوائي العجب when the things that pull one into narcissism are, are inciting one to, to, to feel special to feel special because of one's talents or gifts then it's oblig obligatory to re recollect Allah's favor. If you think about it, what's really amazing, every, everything in our religion is rooted in Tawheed. Everything in our religion is rooted in Tawheed. It's recognizing the oneness of Allah. Uh, like this disease, it's because of forgetting Allah's oneness. Mm -hmm. And you think that these talents are just coming. It's like the, it's like the atheist, Although the per, um, person of Ojib is still Muslim, but it's like the atheist who thinks the whole universe came from nothing. You think your gifts came from nothing? You think they just sprung into existence without a creator? So the same way the, the atheist or the cosmologist who thinks the Big Bang just happened and there's no explanation and, you know, the scientist seeks out the cause of everything in the world except the whole world. <laughs> it's a bit prejudiced. The scientists seek out every single thing that happens. They want to know what made, what caused that, what caused that, what caused that. When they find out the world had a beginning and they call it the Big Bang, they say, I'm not going to ask what caused it. It's a bit biased and prejudiced, right? So, so the whole world, they say, it just came out of nothing. It just spontaneously, something from nothing. So that we're, the person of Ojib is co-sharing in that disease. Because it's like these talents just came out of nothing? No, it's the Tawheed. The, our religion is a religion of radical Tawheed. The only thing radical in our religion is our recognition of Allah's oneness. This is the only thing radical in our religion, the monotheism in the heart of the believer, realizing Allah's oneness. So the gift of the garment, the gift of the food, the gift of the talent, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's act in that gift, recognizing the Tawheed of Allah in that gift. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thalathun Muhlikat. Anas relates, Allah be pleased with him. That the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is related by Bayhaqi. Thalathun Muhlikat. There are three things that are destructive. There are three things that are utterly destructive. Shuhun muta' wa hawan muttaba' wa ijabul mar'i bi nafsihi. Shuhun muta' stinginess that is obeyed. Stinginess in the soul that a person succumbs to. Wahawan muttaba and whims that one follows. Stubborn whims, hawa, that a person follows. This, this is particularly with intellectual whims. Hawa in our tradition is used particularly for intellectual whims. When a person is stubborn with their opinions. When the person is stubborn with their opinions. And it's used often for those opinions that are against our creed. Those opinions that are against our creed and against the way of the of, of traditional Sunnism. So so what could be called often do it yourselfism. The opposite of Sunnism is do it yourselfism. And when you think you can do it, just give me the kitab and I learn enough Arabic and I can read certain books now and I can figure out the religion. If you think about it, this is the root cause of the entire spectrum of the Ummah's problems right now. On, 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 the, on one end of this extreme liberalism that manifests with things like the gay Muslim phenomenon where homosexuality is being justified, right, by rereading of the scripture, and on the other end by violent terrorism where the most demonic, harmful acts to fellow man are being justified by a rereading of scripture, and everything in between. Everything in between. What's the common denominator? The root of all of this is do-it-yourselfism. Is that I have access to the book, I have access to a certain corpus, hadith or whatnot, or commentaries. 
I know enough Arabic, you know, to read the modern newspaper or whatnot. It's not even classical Arabic, it's just modern. And now, on my own, I can figure, I can navigate this tradition, I can figure this tradition out. And we mentioned earlier, Sunnism is about revelation and suhba first, before reason. This paradigm is using your own reason first, without suhba, without any chain of narration, without any murabbi, without any sheikh, murshid, guide, teacher, scholar that you're learning from. And this is the recipe of the whole spectrum of, of diseases. It's, it, it emerges from this do-it-yourselfism. What's the opposite of do-it-yourselfism? Traditional Sunnism. Traditional Sunnism. Really. And so the Prophet saying, Sallallahu of the three things that are destructive, the second, Hawan Muttaba, Hawan is your intellectual whim that you're so stubbornly holding on to that's contrary to the way of the Sunnah. This is what Hawa means. And so Hawan, do-it-yourselfism, Muttaba, that's enacted, that's followed in the world. This destroys, we can see how it's destroying the fabric of society, not simply the soul of the human being, but the fabric of society. No. What is an intellectual whim? An intellectual whim, it's, 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 it's like a, a, an opinion, uh, particularly about the religion, that contravenes the way of, of our traditional ulama, but, and, so it's, it, and a person is stubbornly holding on to it. Stubbornly holding on to it. So, all of these notions, these are intellectual whims. These are whims of the mind uh, that, that uh, the people, people do not let go of, you know. Um, the third thing in the hadith, Salath al-Muhlikat, the third thing that destroys, I'jab al-mar'i bi nafsihi, which is in the context of our discussion, when a man is impressed with himself. When a person is impressed with himself, it destroys the person, it destroys the very fabric of society, and it's related to the second part of the hadith, the whims that are followed. Because when you follow your whim and then you're impressed with your own opinion, it's a recipe for disaster. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Fatir, verse 8, أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا or, or, or the one whose wretched act is adorned in his mind. Zuyina lahu. Su amalihi. His wretched, horrible action is adorned for him. Fara'au hasana. So he deems it to be beautiful. Audu billah. This is the state of the ummah. Horrible actions that are beautified in the diseased minds of people who have no connection to our tradition. And then ra'au hasana. They think this is the right thing to do. They think this is the right thing to do. You know, subhanAllah, look at the miracle of the Qur'an. One, two, three, four, five, in seven, eight words in this, the beginning of this ayah, Surah Fatir, verse eight, Allah Ta'ala has diagnosed, He gives us the diagnosis of the whole spectrum of the problems of the Ummah. That's it, right there. That's it. That's the power of the Qur'an, Allah's speech. Eternal speech, it's applicable right now, currently. Allah speaking, أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا or the one whose disgusting, horrific, wretched action is adorned and decorated in his diseased mind so much that he actually thinks, it, thinks it's good. He thinks it's good. A'udhu Billah. And then look at, subhanAllah, how Imam Nahlawi concludes the section. He says, فَإِلَاجْ هَذَا الْعُجُبْ أَعْسَرْ وَأَسْعَبْ So the, the, the treatment of ujab, this ujab, which is when you're impressed specifically with your intellectual whims and your opinions, he says it's the most difficult to treat. If sahibuhu yadunnuhu ilma, la jahla, because the possessor of it thinks that it's actual knowledge and not ignorance. Wa ni'matan la niqma, and he thinks it's a blessing from God, not a punishment from God. Wa sihhatan la marada, he thinks he's healthy and not diseased. فَلَا يَطْلُبُ الْعِلَاجِ So he's not going to seek treatment in the first place. وَلَا يُسْخِي إِلَى الْأَطِبَّاءَ الْرُوحَانِيِّينَ Look at this. And such a person will not, will not seek out the, the, the treatment of the spiritual doctors. الْأَطِبَّاءَ الْرُوحَانِيِّينَ 
الذين يعلمون امراض القلوب ويداونها those who understand the diseases of the heart and treat them and who are they وهم علماء اهل السنه والجماعه عجيب and they are the righteous scholars of Sunni orthodoxy and consensus. Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. They are the righteous scholars of the Sunni tradition. Nasr Allah Ta'ala kalimatahum ila qiyam as He makes dua, may Allah give victory to their words until the final hour. Tayyab, the 15th one. The 15th one is hasad, envy. Hasad Imam Nahlawi defines it, Rahimullah, Irad to Zawali Niamatillahi Ta'ala and Ahadin, Mimma lahu fihi salah hundini au dunyawi, Min Ghadi Darar Fidalikal Amr, Fil Akhira. O Adam Irad to Suliha Ilahi Fahub, Wahubuhu Min Ghadi in Karin Lahu. Hasad or envy. Um, envy is to desire the removal of a blessing of Allah from a person. Envy is to desire the removal of a blessing of Allah from a person. When that blessing entails religious benefit or worldly benefit for that person, yet no religious harm. This is very nuanced. These definitions are very important. Envy is to desire the removal of a blessing of Allah from a person when that blessing entails either religious or worldly benefit, either religious benefit or worldly benefit for that person, yet no religious harm. Yet no religious harm. So, you see a blessing in someone else, you see someone else that has a blessing from Allah, and that blessing is beneficial for them, whether their deen or their dunya. Whether their deen or their dunya. Their position to serve the religion. They have the talents to serve the religion in a particular capacity. They're a good speaker, they're a good writer, they're knowledgeable, they're a servant, they're positioned in a certain organization to, to work for the religion. They're a qari, they're a philanthropist, they can, they, whatever avenue they have of serving the religion, they have reli of, of allowing for religious benefit or worldly benefit. You see a blessing in someone that enables them to succeed in their work that enables them to have a better education, that enables their children to have better education, that enables their, you know, their, their loved one to, do, to succeed in something wor worldly. It's not even religious. Not, it has nothing to do with religion. Allows for worldly benefit. Okay. And coupled with that is it does not entail religious harm. So it's not going to entail them doing something sinful. It's not going to entail them... Uh, going in a path that would make them far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, in that case, if you desire that Allah takes away that blessing, you wish they didn't have that blessing, that's hasad. If you wish they did not have that blessing, that's hasad. Why did he add that last part? Because if you see a blessing in someone that allows for worldly benefit but religious harm, then you might want them not to have it because you care for them. You're, you're realizing that that's going to harm their deen and so you wish they didn't have it because you love them and you don't want them to be in trouble in the next life or even this life as a repercussion of what that could do to their relationship with Allah. That's not hasad. It's out of a genuine concern and love for them. So he added this point at the end, yet no religious harm. When, it, when there's no religious harm entailed, then the blessing, whether of religious benefit or worldly benefit, you should love for them to have it. You should be content that Allah gave them that blessing. So if you, if you find yourself that you wish they didn't have it, this is hasad. You've fallen into hasad. Uh, and he gives a second 
version of this is, or if you desire that such a blessing did not reach them in the first place. You wish they never got it. So there's, there's a different vantage, that you wish they lose it now, or you wish they never got it in the first place. There's two sides of the same coin. It's hasad. Some ulama have added that this can be diagnosed even if you find agitation in the heart. It's very, very important to, be, to monitor one's heart in these situations. Even if you find a, a bit of agitation or stress or anxiety or discomfort in the heart because of someone else's blessing, there's a piece of hasad there. It doesn't have to come, become an outright thought of, I wish they lost it or I wish they didn't get it. Even that initial discomfort, agitation in the heart is a type of hasad in the heart. The, the goal of the believer is to be completely content and smooth with the distribution of blessings in creation. To allow Allah to distribute, distribute as He wants. To give Allah the right, which is His right, to distribute as He wants. Alhamdulillah. And to let the dhikr of Alhamdulillah flow upon the soul. Ideally, and, and we say this like gazing at the stars, we want to aspire to these levels, it's like water. Where the Alhamdulillah flows on the soul like water. Like if there's no agitation at what Allah has given fellow man, fellow human beings. A third way envy could manifest is if you notice another person's envy and you don't condemn it. You're pleased with it. There's no internal condemning of it. You don't necessarily have to speak against it, but internally you should condemn it. If you find yourself content and happy that they're envious of someone else, that's something of your envy then. It's only because of envy inside that you're okay with someone else having, if they manifest envy, for example. It should be condemned in, in, in the heart. Uh, there's a very nice quote from Sea Without Shore on this topic. I'll read this. <clears throat> Some egos are so possessed by envy that even hearing another praised, even hearing another praised, weighs upon them. One must watch one's heart and reactions carefully, for envy lies at ambush on any path, even spiritual. <clears throat> that involves both a social collectivity and striving in excellence. Anytime we're in a group, a collective, that's a social collective, and there's some sort of striving for excellence, envy is awaiting, ready to attack people of that group. Whenever envy appears, <clears throat> one must pop the pustule while it is still small. By, how do you pop the pustule? By sincere sorrow and disgust at the sin, and asking Allah's forgiveness, istighfar, make a lot of istighfar, astaghfirullah for that, and telling Allah that one does not accept this trait from one's nafs. This must be repeated every time it occurs to one. If left alone, it will become an abscess, it will grow to become an abscess, and finally a full cancer. When one's thoughts revolve around nothing but the envied, and the heart is on fire, it then requires great mujahada to treat, great exertion to treat. By doing all of the above, in addition, sincerely praying for the person whenever he comes to one mind, whenever he comes to mind, praying what? That Allah prosper him in this world as well as the next. That Allah prosper him in this world as well as the next. So we should be very, very vigilant in attacking this disease by making istighfar, by telling Allah we don't accept this by making du'a for that person, feeling disgust at it, making du'a for that person, for not simply the akhirah, but for this world. Oh Allah, let them, thrive, let them succeed in this world. Grant them great tawfiq in this world. Let them shine in this world. Because we should, we should, we should, we should uh, love for them what we love for ourselves. And, and so, it's easiest to get it at the beginning. It's easiest to get it, nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud, otherwise it'll, become, it'll, it'll overwhelm, God forbid. Okay, some of the fiqh of envy. 
when is it haram versus simply blameworthy. Imam Nahlawi says, if envy occurs to the heart inadvertently and the person immediately condemns it, then by agreement there's no harm in that. He has not committed sin. If envy occurs to the heart inadvertently and the person condemns it internally, then by agreement there is no harm in that. There is no sin in that. If he does not condemn it, however, or if it occurs by choice, he chooses to be envious, then by agreement, it is unlawful envy. Uh, Afwan. Uh, the fiqh is a bit complicated. We'll just, so by agreement, it's unlawful envy if he acts accordingly even if only a trace of it manifests on his limbs, to actually act out the envy. If he does not act accordingly, and there's, sim there's simply that envy in the heart that he either chose or that he did not condemn, then there is a bit of khilaf, but the opinion of Ghazali and the majority is that it's haram, and we should stick with that opinion. So let me repeat the fifth. It occurs inadvertently, and the person condemns it immediately. Everyone agrees there's no sin incurred. Okay, but one should strive to, it doesn't even occur inadvertently. One should reach those higher levels. But if it does occur inadvertently and the person immediately nips it in the bud, they're free of sin. Okay, if he, however, he does not condemn it, he allows it to stay. Or if he actually indulges it, he chooses to have envy. Then if he acts it out, if he does something to get, to get that person to, to harm them in some way or something, then everyone agrees it's haram. Everyone agrees that that action is haram. However, if he, ha if he does not act on it and it simply exists in the heart, there is a bit of khilaf amongst the fuqaha. There is a difference opinion amongst the fuqaha. Is it haram or just blameworthy? The position of Ghazali is that it's haram. And this is the opinion we should follow because it's, a, it's such a big disease and cancer, uh, we should not allow s such a thing to, to, we should be vigilant against it. So uh, that, that's, that's uh, the, sort of the thick breakdown on that. Now, this differs from ghibta. Hasad differs from ghibta. What's ghibta? Ghibta is a type of jealousy that's not that's not unlawful. You know, we're using envy for hasad. There's a type of jealousy, ghibta, that's not unlawful, which is what? Which is that if the person does not desire the removal of another's blessing, they simply desire to have the same for themselves. So I don't want the other person to lose their blessing at all. I'm completely happy that they have that blessing, but I wish I had the same. Mm -hmm. This is not hasad at all. This is ghibta. Ghibta is not haram. Ghibta is a type of, it's a type of jealousy that's permissible in the Sharia. If it's for something of religious benefit, it's actually recommended. Someone is so adept at reciting Quran, I wish I had the same. I don't want them to lose it, I wish I had the same. It's actually recommended because that'll move you to pursue improving your recitation of Quran. Someone I noticed, they're so generous, I wish I had that trait. That's praiseworthy because it'll move you to work on being more generous. So we see the good in others, religious good in others. It can, it's a means to improve ourselves. It's a, it's a praiseworthy thing in the religion. Praiseworthy ghibta. If it's of something worldly, then it's blameworthy. If it's of something worldly, it's not a healthy thing. It's not haram, but it's not a good thing. So so-and-so has the Mercedes. I wish I had the Mercedes too. There's nothing haram, as long as you don't want them to lose their Mercedes. Don't get happy if someone keys their Mercedes. Okay? A'udhu <laughs> Billah. If someone keys their Mercedes, don't get happy. Uh, if you want that Mercedes, there's nothing haram, but it's not ideal, right? That's not, a, that's not a necessarily the best place to be. Unless you want a Mercedes for some good cause, like you want, maybe you have a religious aim in mind. What's the religious aim of having a Mercedes? 
Like, he would be so respected in society. People would be like, oh, these Muslims got it down. <laughs> so, you know, there's some good aim that you have for the, for the religion. Then, inshallah, it falls under religious good. So, if you can tie it to something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's all good. But if it's purely worldly, right, I wish I had, a, had that worldly thing too. It's not a good place to be, but it's not, it's not uh, haram at all. And Allah knows best. And the thing is, it's, the problem is, it's a door to problems. That's why it's blameworthy. It's a door to a lot of problems. Because then you get the Mercedes, and then the, the other guy gets the upgraded with the 2 Series to the 4 Series, and now you don't like your 2 Series anymore. <laughs> so you're going to be a sin. You're going to lack sugar, lack gratitude, lack contentment, always be frustrated. If you're looking at other people's blessings, even if you don't want them to lose it, you're in a bad place. That's why it's blameworthy. So ideally, just be with Allah, and, and inshallah, you'll be happy. Ya Rab. The opposite of hasad, the opposite of hasad is nasiha, is genuine concern and well-wishing. Genuine concern and well-wishing. Nas nasiha, which is that you desire for others to have those blessings. You're happy that they have their blessings. You want it to continue because you care about them. When you want good for others. And this is incumbent upon the servant. He says this is a wajib on the servant. It is wajib to have nasiha. Okay? It is wajib. It is a religious obligation to have nasiha. As our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ad-deenu nasiha. The entire religion is genuine concern for the other. The entire religion is genuine concern for the other. And even more powerful as an antidote, even more powerful as an antidote to one's hasad is ithar. Ithar is when you push yourself, when you push yourself to reach the sublime level of preferring others over yourself. Preferring others over yourself. So if a person can really work on acquiring ithar, on acquiring uh, this preference for others, then they will be free of hasad. And inshallah, the barakah of that will be greater than whatever blessing they used to envy. The barakah of ithar will be better than whatever blessing they might have envied before. So this is the ultimate cure for hasad. Uh, I wanted to read, we'll conclude inshallah with this and then see if there's questions. I wanted to read from uh, So Sheikh Mustafa Al-Arusi, Rahimullah, Sheikh Mustafa Al-Arusi, he was the Sheikh of Azhar in the 19th, mid 19th century, 1800s on the uh, Western calendar. And this was at a time when Azhar was still Azhar uh, in the most traditional sense. And so he wrote uh, a commentary on, he wrote a super commentary on Qushayri's Risala. And it's a phenomenal, phenomenal work of our tradition. It's a hidden treasure of our tradition. And so Qushayri has Babul Hasad, the chapter on Hasad. This is the introduction of the commentator, Sheikh Arusi, uh, on Qushayri's chapter on envy. He says that, أقول الحسد تمنى زوال نعمة الغير عنه فهو من الكبائر. It's very scary. He says that, I note, uh, envy is to desire for another person to lose their blessing, and this is of the major sins in Islam. This is of the enormities, kaba'ir of Islam. Uh, and then he talks about that, he, he makes the distinction between this and ghibta, which is simply wanting for yourself the same. And he says there's different types of that, and we already talked about that. He says, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ الْحَسَدْ 
على معنى تمني زوال نعمة الغير عن ذلك الغير عظيم اسمه عند الله حسد which the unlawful حسد which is to want another to lose their blessing is a great sin with Allah قد هلك به كثير قديما وحديثا Many, many people have perished because of this, both in ancient times as well as recent times. وَبِهِ هَلَكَ إِبْلِيسِ وَجُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ And this is the source of how Iblis and the other dominions, uh, other minions uh, have perished. قَالَ تَعَالَى And he says the جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ You know, the time of the Prophet ﷺ, most of the people who rejected him was out of hasad. That why did God choose him? He's just the orphan of Bani Hashim. You know, I am the Azim of Quraysh. This is the Azim of Ta'if. There we have the notables. Why would Allah Ta'ala choose the orphan of Bani Hashim? So many, many people uh, have perished because of Hasid. Qala Ta'ala. He quotes an ayah uh, from the Quran. What the Kathirum min Ahli al Kitabi. لو يردونكم من بعد إيمانكم كفارا حسنا حسدا من عند أنفسهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الحق الآية. giving an example of how people that reject faith they they do so out of hasad and they want the believers to lose their faith. now he says وحكم الحسد شيخ عروسي continues وحكم الحسد the legal ruling of envy التحريم it's حرام وسببه this is really important. The cause of envy, al-i'tirad ala fi'l al-hakim. It is objecting to the action of the all-wise. It is objecting to the action of the all-wise. And we said earlier, the cure of all these diseases is our tawheed. And so when a person is upset that someone else has a blessing, they are objecting to Allah and His hikmah in giving that person that blessing. وَثَمْرَتُهُ What's the fruit of hasad? دوام الهم الجسيم Is perpetual anxiety. Is perpetual and colossal anxiety. هم جسيم A great amount of anxiety that lasts. Perpetual and colossal anxiety. فَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَرْزُقُنَا السَّلَامَ وَالتَّسْلِيمِ May Allah protect us uh, from this بِجَهَ الرَّسُولِ الْعَظِيمِ by the by the station of the Messenger Sallallahu I can't resist the, you notice the tawassal of the Shaykh of Azhar in the 19th century. And he's the Shaykh of exoteric Islam, Azhar. The, 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 the uh, Kaaba of the people of seeking knowledge in our tradition. وَقَالَ بَعْدُهُمْ One of the masters said, سَبُبُهُ The reason that a person has hasad, كَثْرَةُ الْجَهَالَاتِ is just the layers of ignorance. The layers and layers, multiplicity of ignorance. وَقِلَّةُ الْيَقِينِ And how little yaqeen they have in Allah. If a person of yaqeen, they don't object to what Allah is doing. وَدَنَاءُ الطَّبْعِ And the vileness of their nature. They have a low nature. وَسُوِ adab And bad adab with Allah. وَعَدَمُ الْقَنَعْ بِالْمَقْسُومِ And not being content with Allah's distribution. وَعَدَمُ الْرِضَى بِقَضَاءِ الْحَكِيمِ And not being pleased with the decree of the all-wise. وَالْبُعْدْ عَنْ مَقَامَاتِ الْعُبُودِيَةِ And being distant from the stations of servitude. Being distant from the stations of servitude. It's like we're all ibad of Allah. What right do we have to even open our mouths? What right do we have to say a word to Allah's actions? Allah does as He pleases. And so a person that has hasad, they're trying to take something of rububiya. Uh, I have a say in the way these dis- blessings should be distributed. The abd, you know, we just work here. We're not here to make any decisions. Hatta ka'annahu yunazi ahkam rububiya To the extent that it's as if he is objecting, he's on the table objecting with Allah to the rulings of lordship. وَيَنْسِبْ Pay attention here. وَيَنْسِبْ الظُّلْمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي أَحْكَامِهِ فِي الْعَبِيدِ And implicitly, he's ascribing ظُلْم, injustice to Allah in his rulings for his servants. تَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَنْ ذَلِكَ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا Allah is sublimely above that. That Because what's ظُلْم in our tradition? What's ظُلْم defined as? But what's the definition of injustice? 
Placing something where it doesn't belong. Placing something where it doesn't belong. Vun wada shayfi to place something in its improper place. So by saying Allah, why did you give that blessing to that person? Even if the heart is agitated, it's as if they're saying, Allah, you missed the right spot. I'm the right spot. A'udhu billah ta'ala Allah. فَهُوَ حِينَ إِذِنْ مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ From that perspective, it is of the enormities of Islam, a major sin of Islam. وَدَآتَ الْخَطِرَ And the very dangerous diseases. فَعَلَى مَنْ قَامَ بِقَلْبِهِ دَاوُ الْحَسَدِ So the person that finds in his heart the disease of hasad, al-mubadara ila ilajihi. They should rush to its treatment. This is an emergency ER. <laughs> this is not slow, long-term ICU. This is an ER, rush to the emergency room. How? By returning to realizing the state of one's soul. And placing one's nafs, placing one's soul under the dominion of being a servant. Under the domination of Allah of being a servant. With taslim al-kainat ila hikmat al-mudabbir al-hakim. And consigning all events in the world to the wisdom of the all-wise manager and disposer of his affairs. Khususan, especially in light of the fact, wala fa'ida fil munaza'a. There's no benefit anyways. You're not going to pull the blessing out. It's, it's going to stay where it's supposed to be. خُصُوصًا وَلَا فَائِدَةً Especially because there's no benefit in objecting لِمَا قَضَاهُ الْحَكِيمِ In what Allah has already decreed in eternity. بَلْ جَمِيعُ الْمُقَدَّرَاتِ لَا بُدَّ مِنْ كَوْنِهِ مِنْ كَوْنِهَا عَلَى مُوجَبْ إِرَادَتِهِ تَعَالَى Rather, everything that occurs, that has been decreed, must necessarily take place exactly as Allah has willed. It's, it's not going to change anything anyways. وَلَا يَعُودْ شُؤْمُ الْحَسَدِ إِلَّا عَلَى مَنْ قَامَ بِهِ and the, and, the, and the evil of that disease only returns to the possessor. أَمَّا فِي الدُّنْيَا فَبِالْهَمِّ وَالْغَمِ How? In this life, stress and anxiety. You're all stressed, about, stressed out about how so-and-so is doing. So you're suffering because of the hasad. وَأَمَّا فِي الْآخِرَةِ فَبِالْعَذَابِ الْأَنِيمِ Let alone the punishment in the next life. God forbid. No. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us from these diseases and uh, alhamdulillah we did 15 or so, uh, give or take, maybe 10 in depth as a, inshallah, a beginning or a continuation of a journey to fix ourselves. Sariya uh, Saqati, the Shaykh of Junaid, what does he say? He says that... So we'll end on the note of introspection. He says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحْبَطَ لِلْعَمَلِ وَلَا, ولا uh, uh, أَفْسَدَ لِلْقَلْبِ وَلَا أَسْرَعَ لِهَلَاكِ الْعَبْدِ وَلَا أَدْوَمَ لِلْإِدْرَارِ وَلَا أَقْرَبَ لِلْمَقْتِ وَلَا أَلْزَمْ لِتَرِيكِ الْعُجْبِ وَالْرِيَاءِ وَالْحَسَدِ مِنْ قِلَّةِ مَعْرِفِ الشَّخْصِ, معرفة الشخص بذنوبه. The Shaykh of Junaid, he says that I never saw Anything that destroys one's good deeds, one's good, good deeds, nor anything that's more corrupting for the heart, nor anything that's quicker to destroy a servant, nor anything that's more long-lasting in causing harm to others, nor anything that is closer to the hatred of Allah, nor anything that is, keeps a person more stuck in diseases like narcissism and showing off and envy, then qillati ma'rifat al-shakhs bi dhunubihi. Then how little a person knows his own sins. Then how little a person knows his own sins. So what's the very uh, starting point, point of departure for all of these discussions is that we should be self-examining. We should be introspective and we should watch out for these things and inshallah take care of them while they're small. So are there, if there's any questions, we'll endeavor to address them inshallah. Bismillah. Walaikum salam rahmatullah. You mentioned tadallul and ifa, and there's one kind of tadallul that is not recommended, which is tadallul to humans, unless it's to a sheikh or people of knowledge. How, what would be the distinction between tadallul and ifa? The distinct, distinction between tadallul and ifa? So, yeah, tadallul is a type of flattery or 
uh, self-abasement that's normally blameworthy with a few exceptions and even in those exceptions it shouldn't be excessive even with a teacher or student it shouldn't be just moderate for the sake of the benefit of getting gaining more and uh and uh but otherwise we one one does not display that although we said internally one should have that state because of allah's majesty um ithar is to prefer others over oneself so it's more through in the action in the in the heart to be content and be happier that other people are succeeding than oneself or through the actions of giving preference through others whether gifts or one's time or one's energy or one's khidma one is doing more for the other than one does even for themselves this is ithar both in the state of the heart being content that other people have more as well as the state of the actions the the, the actions of the limbs with one's time not simply gifts of the hand charity or or gifts but actually one's time one's energy one's khidma doing more for others than for oneself and realizing that Allah will do more for you than inshallah wallahu fi awn al-abd ma dam ma kana al-abd fi awni akhihi Allah is in the service and help Allah helps the servant so long as he is helping his his fellow brother so this is ithar uh, wallahu alam any other questions? Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that to treat ignorance, uh, I mean, uh, to treat kibble arrogance is to treat the ignorance that underlies it. <coughs> what would you say some practical ways that we could do in our everyday life to treat arrogance or to practice humility? Yeah, that's a good question. So practical ways in our everyday life to treat arrogance and practice humility um khidma serving other people uh especially when there's not much recognition so excuse me like low profile khidma low profile khidma so there's not much recognition there's not much of an applause but you it's really just you and Allah and the one that you're serving this is a way uh inshallah um mundane chores are really helpful you know, so the day-to-day -day chores that we take for granted to maybe lift a couple more fingers. Uh, if someone has a lot of arrogance, they should really just take ownership of all the household chores and it'll really humble them, right? And to embrace situations where Allah s sort of humbles us in, in, in amongst, in society. And we ask Allah to be gentle with his actions that you know the, the the situations in different contexts when your coworker your boss your friends your relatives your in-laws <laughs> you might in these different contexts where you feel humbled you know you're not esteemed as much as in other contexts or that you think you should be then to just at those moments uh, you know not object to embrace that and to realize it's good for the nafs to to go through that and so, so to, to embrace those, those situations. And uh, it's like the man said, I had a problem with putting up with other people. Hilm, forbearance. I had a problem with hilm, of putting up with other people when they're annoying. So to, one of the Salaf said this. He said, to cure it, I found the most annoying person in town to room with. And I roomed with him as a roommate for several months until I came out fully forbearing. I could handle all annoying situations. <laughs> so Allah Ta'ala, and you know, one of the names of Allah, He's Rabb, Rabbul Alameen. Rabb means tarbiya. He calls Himself tarbiya. And in fact, Rabb is not the one that does tarbiya. Literally in, in, in the Arabic language, Rabb is the act of tarbiya. Because He does so much tarbiya, He calls Himself tarbiya. It's like the person that has so much courage, you don't just say He's courageous, you say He's courage itself. He is courage. He has so much of it. Allah has so much tarbiya, He calls Himself tarbiya. Rabb means tarbiya. So He's, he's the tarbiya of us, of each of us, Rabbul Alameen. And so Allah is elevating our states through the different situations of our lives. He's, you know, humbling us in different, when He humbles us in different ways and we ask Him to do it gently, then this is, we should, we should realize the tarbiya of Allah and, and embrace those situations, inshallah. Any other questions? Mashallah. 
Khair, inshallah. So uh, we ask Allah Ta'ala to cure us of our diseases mm -hmm. and cure the ummah of the collective diseases. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.